public can attend. I'm Councillor Iris Beach and I'm Vice Chair of this committee. Um, to my right is Roy Sykes who is the um, planning manager and then we have Heidi Lahane who is the um, governance officer, uh, no she's the legal officer sorry, and then David Taylor who is governance officer and tonight, today three officers will be attending, they are Mark Saw, David Richards and Alicia Murray. Um, before we commence the meeting, I would like to confirm a number of procedural issues. We are not expecting a fire practice today. If the alarm sounds, can all present leave the building as quickly as possible by way of the nearest exit? The exits are either through the main doors of this chamber or by the alternative door at the rear of the chamber to my right. Once you have left the chamber, please turn right and proceed down the stairway and exit through the emergency exit on the ground floor. If there is anybody with mobility issues, please wait in the refuge area where the emergency evacuation lift is and use the refuge intercom situated to the left hand side of the lift doors to call for assistance. The designated assembly point is in the public square in front of CAST, beyond the fountain, away from the city civic office. I must ask that you do not stand outside the entrances to the building as this may obstruct emergency services. No roll call will be taken. I would like to inform members of the public and press that today's meeting will be audio and visually recorded, subsequently made available for viewing via the Council's website and YouTube channel. This is an important initiative which will help open up decision making and improve transparency and accountability. As stated on the notice displayed in the Chamber, by entering the Council Chamber, you are accepting that this will be recorded and your images will be retained and broadcast by the Council. I also wish to inform you that as we are in increasing use of technology and moving towards becoming a digital Council, some elected members and officers have downloaded their agenda and reports onto their iPads and tablets using the modern Gov app. Some councillors and officers will therefore be using this technology and during the meeting to read reports on their devices rather than using paper copies. If any members of the public or press are intended to record or film any part of today's meeting, please ensure that this does not disturb the conduct of the meeting. If you are visually recording, you are requested to only focus on recording councillors, officers and the public directly involved in the conduct of the meeting. I would also like to ask everyone in the chamber to ensure that your mobile phone is switched to silent mode, please. In considering each planning application, the planning officer will, represent, will present the application. Uh, then there is five minute opportunity for those speaking and uh, for and against for the, to the application. The speakers and members of the planning committee can ask all questions of the speakers. The committee will then debate the application, ask any further questions of officers and vote on it or make any other recommendations. If any members of the committee leave the chamber during the presentations or debate on the application and return to the chamber before the vote is taken, they should ensure that they do not take part in the vote as they will not have heard all the information and deliberations on this particular item. Thank you. Um, Right, um, I'm afraid there isn't as many um, agendas as, as would be required. So if you're leaving after an application, can you please leave your agenda on the, on the seats? And also, if anyone is here for agenda item three, that has been withdrawn. It will not be heard today. So say anyone who, who wishes to, to leave straight away, it's, it's, it won't be heard. Thank you. Right, move to the agenda. Apologies for absence. Thank you. Um, and next is to consider the extent to which any of the public and press are to be excluded. That is agenda item seven, which are not on the public papers. Thank you. Uh, declarations of interest. Does anyone have any? Councillor Wood. Chair, I just want to state for a matter of the public record, it's not, it's not a peculiar or, or interest that prejudices me, but application two has clearly been running for 10 years thus far and clearly participating in parish council meetings and all the rest of it. I am 
sort of familiar with the case. I haven't given any indication. I wait with interest to hear the officer's views and indeed anybody else that might be speaking. But I just think as a matter for the public record, this having been on the agenda for 10 years, including an appeal, a public inquiry and various other applications, you know, I have, I am largely already familiar, although I'm not going to let that prejudice me. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Are there any further declarations of interest? No, thank you very much. That will be noted. Uh, we move to item four, which is the um, mi minutes of the. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> thank you. If any of the people who have just uh, come in, if you are here for item three, I have to inform you that that item was withdrawn from the agenda. I would hate you to sit here for nothing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, right, minutes of the last meeting. Do I have a m mover for them? Thank you, Councillor Durant. Seconded, Councillor Wood. All in favour? Yes, Chair. Thank you. <coughs> we move on to the agenda now, which is item one, and it is uh, application number 18. 00548, it's of major application at Totero Recycling Banquet Lane, New Rossington, and Dave Richards is the op officer presented. I would hope that, that it was adjourned last time for um, reports to do with um, pollution, etc. I would hope that you have all managed to struggle through the rather complicated report. Thank you. Uh, Dave. <coughs> Thank you. Hello, everybody. This application was deferred. This application was deferred by members of the uh, at the last planning committee meeting to review the information submitted with the application relating to air quality, traffic generation, and noise. Just turning to pre-committee amendments, we have two speakers on the application: Councillor John Cook and a member of the public, Miss Carol Inglis. Uh, Roslington Parish Council. Uh, have updated their response on the application. As you can see, um, they wish to support. Um, they also want to see quality of life for residents is maintained and improved and planning conditions are adhered to. They did want some clarification on operations taking place on uh, Sundays and bank holidays. I've clarified with them that it only relates to internal operations within the processing building and that external operations do not take place um, on Sundays and bank holidays. So there is a slight condition, uh, amendment to the condition 18 to reflect this. I've also included amendments and new conditions which were repeated from the previous meeting as have not been uh, copied over onto the latest report. These conditions relate to the final response of the highway officer and the amendments to the wording of the construction method statement and the use of the processing building. Uh, and finally, I've also amended the recommendation for members to resolve uh, to authorise the assistant director to grant planning permission rather than the head of planning uh, given the fact we don't have one at the moment. I'm not going to go over the um, so general introduction to the application which we covered in the last presentation. Uh, however, we'll focus on the topics of discussion from the last meeting. Uh, <clears throat> we do have the relevant uh, consultees with us today as well for any technical questions. But in terms of traffic generation, the submitted transport assessment uses modelling and the current demand to the site to anticipate the increase in HGV movements based on a worst case scenario. Despite this, the proposed access road is purpose built to accommodate this traffic uh, and our transportation team has found that the highway network has capacity to accommodate these movements. The highway officer has assessed the application um, from a technical point of view and found it to be acceptable. As such, officers agree there's no significant risk to highway safety. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, air quality, the consultants have used the existing network of modelling tubes. You can see it better on that screen, in fact. Uh, and uh, also predicted modelling mod to provide evidence to agreed technical standards. Uh, officers have assessed the existing and predicted impacts of exposure to emissions and found the impacts to be negligible when assessed against these national standards. The air quality assessment also sets out strategies for dealing with dust, litter and odour during the construction phase and this is reflected in condition 4 um, which is dealing with the construction phase of development. The assessment also includes the day-to-day -day operation of the site um, to ensure a joined up approach with the environment agency uh, who manage and enforce the environmental permit for the site. 
uh, your air quality officers have assessed this evidence and found the relative impacts on air quality to be acceptable. In terms of noise impact, the um, noise assessment submitted with the application can demonstrate that predicted noise levels from the operation would not be significant from a perspective of sensitive users nearby and therefore is likely to result in a low impact. There is a number of mitigation measures included in the development, including reorganising the site layout and the use of bunding uh, as recommended in the noise assessment. The environmental health officers have got no objection on this basis. Uh, it should also be noted that obviously the main source of noise complaints uh, relate to the HGV use, um, uh, HGV activity co to come to and from the site. Obviously this um, application would redirect those movements away from residential areas. In terms of other considerations, if the application is approved by members today, the Laurie Park application will return to planning committee with a recommendation for a time-limited temporary permission to cover the access road and permanent Laurie Park um, construction process to become operational. The Laurie Park will then be closed. The committee report sets out various conditions which provide a modern set of controls on the site. These include conditions on tonnage throughput, stockpiling heights, drainage, revised boundary treatments, bunding and planting. These conditions uh, are all included within the report and also conditions relating to front loading the development of the site so the road and the lorry park comes first before an expansion of the site. So in conclusion, the officers have delivered an acceptable application which will ensure that Etero uh, HDV traffic is removed or largely removed from the residential areas of Rosington. The planning impacts of this development have been evidenced by external consultants and assessed by your officers and found to be acceptable. This together with the public benefit of redirecting HGV traffic and providing a dedicated lorry park has res resulted in the development being acceptable in line with our local and national policies. As such, it is put to you to grant delegated authority as per the report recommendation uh, amended by the uh, items listed in the pre-committee amendments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got Councillor Blake who was listed to speak, this is for members, um, but she is, she's present but she does no longer wishes to speak. So we have two speakers. Uh, Councillor John Cook, um, would you like to come to the speaker's chairs please? <laughs> Um, you have up to five minutes, uh, Councillor Cook, from when you begin. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, hello, committee. It's only a brief one, but uh, I think uh, it's important. Overall, I think the residents of Rosington, and especially the Bankwood Estate, welcome the scheme proposal. The residents of Bankwood Lane and Western Lane are crying out for a solution to this problem with the HGVs. This link road enables us to do that. Although I and the Relative Parish Council have our reservations and disquiet in regard to the increase of proposed operations on the site, it is really relevant and really important that we relieve the residents of the actual burden they're carrying at the moment. So in that respect, I say, not too happy about them increasing any production, but it outweighs it is the solution to the problem. It's very disappointing also, we feel, and the RCP feel, well, the Russell Parish Council feel, that it, sadly there was legal documentation that needed to be put into place and signed by all parties that would have ensured a complete solution to all the problems on Bankwood Lane, which would have been phase one, which was the Terra Link Road, and phase two, the tanks and vessels extended road version. Sadly, to this point, it's not been done, but we're hoping it will be done shortly in the future. This would it basically sort of like create an overall solution to a very significant problem down at that site. We welcome anything that moves towards this. Also, in regard to the site itself, there was a green field aspect to it that was important and drawn up by members. I know it's dear to my heart of green fields, but part of that greenfield in itself was sectioned off basically as a some farmyard, work area, chicken run. The area that's in question that they want to change over 
it's not really a site of outstanding natural beauty it's really sort of like a badly put sort of like work area it was sectioned off the rest of the field was used for horses and in fact it was very green and should be retained and will be retained hopefully in regard to the operations on the site the environment agency will be diligent and enforce anything and all the aspects of the permit that's involved I'm assuming, and now you can correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, the EA will or can allow the permit to go up to 400,000 tonnes. I know it's in the planning application, but I think it's up to them to actually take that up. Now, if the operators of Tero fail to meet their obligations on those 200,000 tonnes, I would hope that the EA takes this into account when deciding whether or not to increase it. I think broadly in all, the residents of Rosington would welcome any solution to this problem, and I support this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Um, councillors, do you have any questions of Councillor Cook? Councillor Wood? Thank you, Chair. Just, just a brief one, Councillor. Obviously, you talked a little bit there about the, 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 the size of the permit that's allowed by the Environment Agency and then the context associated with the planning permission. I know this committee in the past has found itself at odds with the fact that the Environment Agency may offer one thing and permit one thing, and that is always kind of, you know, the council is beaten with a stick essentially on the basis that the Environment Agency have said it's all right, so it's all right. Uh, it, clearly it's very different between getting planning permission and getting an environmental permit. Are you saying then that we ought to alter a condition or, or really tighten up on a condition associated with that so that the, you know, we're not beaten with the stick of the Environment Agency have said we can do that, therefore we could do it. Do you think there ought to be a stronger condition in this application that tries to restrict or requires them to come back again in the future if they go beyond the 200,000? Is that, is that essentially what you're saying? Yeah, that is actually, yeah. I mean, basically I feel that in the past operations, there's been some very sort of like dubious operations on that site, and especially at the current moment in time, we had stockpiles that were massively, massively oversized. I mean, you could see them from miles around, basically, right, which is well in excess of what they should do. I think at the present moment, the good thing about this application is it allows us to basically to sort of like put in provisions for limitations on certain things on their site, whereas before, we, we haven't been able to do that and the EA have been somewhat sort of like slow in doing things. It would be useful if we could get the EA on board, and I hope that we're here, right, to fact is that they should be tighter on these operations, especially on, on Bankwood Lane and that site itself. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Um, now I have uh, Carol Inglis. Is she here? Yeah. Yes, yes, fine. Yes, yes. First time I had to speak, I was terrible. You used to have to stand up in those days. <laughs> right, likewise, you have up to five minutes from when you begin. Sorry, can you hear me? Sorry. My name is Carol Inglis, and I was born in Rosington. I have lived at Bankwood Lane since 1982. I'm speaking on behalf of the residents of the Bankwood area. Over the last three years, we have endured a massive increase in movement of HDV articulated lorries, travelling along Western Lane and turning into Bankwood Lane. <coughs> it has been living next to a motorway, not a residential area. The land directly across the road from our houses have been used as a lorry park which was a former Maritina sewing factory. It was never received planning permission for this type of use. This has caused us major problems from 7.30 a.m. to 6 p.m., Monday to Friday and some Saturdays, with noise, putrid smells and dust. 
Many residents are suffering with health problems as a result. The condition of the ground in the lorry park has broken up with its continued use and the noise has increased. We desperately need the plans for the link road to be passed to alleviate all the stress we have to endure every day. In past meetings with the Mayor, Ross Jones, <coughs> sorry, and Caroline Flynn, MP, there has been wholeheartedly support to resolve our problems with a new link road. We desperately need the plans for this link road to be passed today. Thank you for listening. Chair. Thank you. Do any of the committee have any, <coughs> have any questions? No? That's fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, they don't encourage them. <laughs> right, uh, do you have any questions of the officer? Well, we've also got present uh, officers from the noise, highways and air pollution. So if those are the sort of questions, um, you know, they can, they're here to answer them. Uh, Councillor Shaw. Thank you. Um, obviously, I, I, I raised the, uh, the issue around uh, traffic and increased air pollution. Uh, I thank you for sending the documentation through. I had a look at it. Um, obviously, it's highly technical, um, and um, so it's highly technical. So it's kind of when terms are used like negligible. I, I find negligible very difficult to quantify. Um, you know, in terms of I forget the figure, but I think it was talking about eighty-six thousand truck movements. Is that, have I remembered that right? So it doesn't seem like negligible. I think we've got a real kind of balancing act, and I, and I, and I feel very much for the community. Uh, but I kind of feel like the community's got a bit of a gun to the head. You know, it's kind of well, you know, yeah, you're suffering with this now. And we'll take away that pain, but possibly we're going to create some pain <laughs> somewhere else for you. You know. So can you, in in some ways, explain to me the term negligible? And if eight to six thousand truck movements is negligible, what is not negligible? What is moderate? What is what is you know what what what? Just so you know, as a layperson, you can explain to me you know as well. You know, if it were two hundred thousand trucks, councillor Shaw, then that wouldn't be negligible. Can you give me some sort of idea in your mind when you say it's negligible, what that means in terms of figures? Because it it doesn't seem negligible to me. Thank you for that, Councillor. Um, I, 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 I did see you looking at me, and you were on about uh, traffic movements. Well, that's. It's, it's air were you on about 86,000 traffic movements? 8,600. I haven't seen that the traffic movements within that sort of number within here. Uh, and traffic movements is basically for the question for the traffic uh, officer. Uh, are they here? Highways officer? Air right, so you're, you're on about whether or not the. Um, that's what I mean. Okay, well, I think the answer the other way around is that when we look at air, air quality in general, we look at uh, what they call the annual uh, average daily traffic movements, and we don't look at anything less than 10,000 um, a day. And that's when the air quality regulations came out originally, that's what we were to look at. So 10,000 um, vehicle movements a day is where we start to look at air quality issues. In uh, regards to the actual uh, application in front of us, they did do an air quality assessment uh, based on recognised methodologies and um, inputs from various uh, strands of information, such as essentially traffic data in, in forms of air quality assessment. And for that, we need the number of trips generated, uh, we need the type and percentage of vehicles, uh, the speed of the vehicles, the speed of the road. Uh, this in turn uh, then uh, advises what vehicle emission profiles there might be. So basically, if you know how many HGVs are going, there's an emission profile from, from DEFRA who says how much pollution will be emitted from any particular vehicle. Um, the model then also says it was a pollutant concentrations uh, within the area. That's either from uh, monitoring uh, data such as diffusion tubes or electronic, electronic monitoring. Well, there's no, diffusion uh, no electronic monitoring down that area without some diffusion tubes. And failing that, standard practice is what they call DEFRA generic background data. And that is then 
divided by uh, death for the whole of the UK. Uh, this is all fed into the model. Um, it uses the traffic emission data, the background and ambient data, and predicts the air quality concentrations or impacts within, um, with and without the development in place. So negligible is basically as it sounds really, it's, it's, it's going to have insignificant effects. I, but I can't relate that to vehicle movements. So we're looking at very small increases, in, and there will be increases, um, but very small, but do not breach the quality regulations. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Well, kind of no, but I, I, if I'm honest, I didn't really expect it to. Um, so ju I, I'll just l l kind of try and summarise, really. I mean, currently, you know, across the country, and Doncaster's no different, you know, air quality is becoming very, very poor in this country. And, and w we've got a number of zones w w which air quality is considered to be poor and particulates are too high. And we, we got to this point by using that modelling data and by using words like negligible, haven't we? Because we didn't kind of go overnight, did we? It's all, it's death by a million cuts. Mm. And, 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 and this is my concern, you know, the, 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 the figure, the limit... Councillor, can you make it just a question, please? Um, yes. <laughs> Very naughty. Um, so, I, I, it's not answering my question, it's not satisfied me uh, that, that actually we are, you know, we're on the right track. But thank you for doing your best to uh, to do that. Not really. Uh, yeah. question. Still wasn't a question. Councillor Cooper. Uh, my question is to the highway officer, please, Chair. In paragraph 213, oh, sorry, 214, um, it states that there are a total of approximately 266 HDV two way movements per day. Is that 133, the current, this is the current one, the one that what the, the amount of vehicle movements that would follow if this application is passed increases to 494 HDV two way movements per day? Is the, is the 266 133 in and 133 out, or is it the... Yeah, it's 133 in and 133 out. So on that basis, that's 2,964 weekly, that's based on a, a six day week, because they are working on the Saturdays. Um, they have increased travelling hours, seven while eight, so that takes it 13 hours by my reckoning, and it works out at 38 lorry movements per hour, um, and it takes it up to, if it's a, they're actually saying that the core hours will be seven while seven, so that's 12 hours, and that takes it to 41 lorries per hour. So you've just got slightly less than a, a lorry per minute, I can't find anywhere in the report where it actually states how many lorries the car park will take. Are we confident that with that amount of lorries going in and out per hour, that the lorries are not going to end up stacked up on the road, backed up to the island, and that the lorries are trying to park everywhere they can down the link road? That is an awful amount of lorries going in and out. I just need to make sure that we're not creating a problem with the lorries backing up onto the dual carriageway. We've got Peter to pay Paul, don't we? Yeah. Sorry, Councillor, I'll take that. Um, yeah, the maximum uh, number of HGVs in a peak hour that's going to be entering the site is 32. So although you're sort of splitting up the, the daily movements, um, sort of 50% in, 50% out, um, in the peak um, hour, the, the, the maximum number of vehicles, HGVs entering the site is going to be 32. So there's 20 HGV lorry parking spaces within the site. Um, we've moved the Waybridge further into the site, so there's significant stacking space now for vehicles off the public highway, but within the site curtilage. Um, but within, um, bear with me. Within the documentation that they've provided within the transport assessment, um, section 3.4.2 
the applicant does propose to limit the number of HGVs within the site um, to 20 vehicles at any one time. But in terms of the 32 in, there's sufficient capacity within the site in terms of the lorry park and the stacking space within the site to accommodate those 32 vehicles. If I may, Chair. Uh, it is important this because we did have the lorry stacking up down the dual carriageway some time ago anyway. Um, and I am conscious that when the second phase comes online, if it gets approved, and I understand the application is now in, what are the consequences when that volume of traffic comes in that's going to the other businesses as well on that estate? Um, I'm just conscious that we might get an all snarled up bottleneck down here. Um, are there any traffic management orders or whatever that you can use to prevent lorries parking up away from that site. I'm just conscious that I don't want the rest of Rosington and lorries sneaking up round Bankwood Lane. I know it says there's going to be traffic management and that the road will be shut at Bankwood Access, etc. when the second phase comes online, but we need to make sure that these lorries are not going to creep into the village elsewhere. If we approve this, then this is supposed to be the all singing, all dancing solution to the Bankwood residents' long-standing problems. But I want to make sure that we're not creating problems for the rest of the village at the same time. If you can give me some assurance on that, I would welcome it. In terms of regulating uh, movements or regulating parking, then obviously there's a tra tra traffic regulation order process to go through in terms of implementing waiting restrictions um, and the like. Now that's outside the planning process, that's part of the highways legislation. Um, there's nothing proactive that we would do at this stage, but obviously that will be monitored once this is open. And then if issues manifested themselves, don't forget this is become, going to become adoptable highway, so it becomes our issue as a highway authority. So we would look at those, we would look at the traffic regulations and see whether there's anything that needs to be put in place to overcome the exact issues that, you, that you've just mentioned. Um, Councillor Wood. Thank you, Chair. Just uh, last time this came to committee, obviously it, one of the questions I had was associated with um, the planning agreements that are in place, because invariably what we, what we see when people try to get all of the ducks to stack up in order with landowners and agreements and all the rest of it, I, I think the question I asked was, um, you know, and it was to the agents, was is everything in place to which they said no there isn't and now we have had probably a three or four week delay now uh, maybe uh, and again it, it might be back to the officer but certainly highways as, as we're asking questions of the of the individual officers now are any of those agreements that we were promised were progressing in place right now are we any further forward have we seen anybody drop out is anybody playing the bait and switch of now you've got permission I'm going to up my land price that I was going to contribute that's the first question and the second is obviously you mentioned there about TROs and all the rest of it where we strict access because we're giving an alternate access are we formally doing anything to protect as my as my colleague said here because it, it might be useful to think about TROs immediately to make sure that we don't just push the problem let's not wait for the problem let's be a bit proactive are we doing anything on that, or is this quite literally a socket and see solution? Just with, with regards to the first point, um, my understanding in terms of contracts being signed is it's still with the lawyers at the moment. We don't have agreement as such, but no one, as, as I understand it, is dropped out at this stage. Sorry, yeah. And uh, in terms of the TROs, um, because we, you know, it's trying to predict where the, in terms of doing something proactive, it's trying to predict where the problem is going to manifest itself. Um, I think the issue is, you know, depending on what happens today, then obviously we can then start looking at what could be done and then gearing up, because obviously there's a, there's a time delay in terms of how long it takes to process the TRO. Um, but I think it's a case of, see what happens today in terms of the application and then as things progress then our traffic management team will be looking at issues on the highway network should they arise and if they do they have to react to them through the TRO process. Nothing proactive as such because we don't know where the problem is going to exist and we don't want to start you know, a proliferation of 
double yellow lines all the way around Rosington and all the way around, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's getting the right solution to the, right, to the, to the problem should it, should it manifest itself. Chair, supplementary on that. Uh, uh, obviously, you talked about TROs there and double yellow lines. My, 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 my question wasn't really around double yellow lines. That's a bit of a red herring. You know, traffic weight restrictions cost nothing, but they would give the residents some form of tangible guarantee that they are not going to be blighted by an alternative yeah. solution. I appreciate you say you might like to suck it and see it, but you know, the reality is I think that we could do just a little bit of work, and I'm not saying that this should stop the application, you know, but I, I think a little bit more forethought. We've got clearly going to have a switch of lorries going from going directly through a residential area to an alternative use there. Uh, we've still got the piece of land, I know it's not part of the application, but we've got the piece of land on the corner that was causing a lot of the problems before. I mean, I, 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 I hate to restrict the use of that, that, that piece of land that's no, not part of this application, but even a TRO to try and reduce the weight limit, so maybe some commercial vehicles can still come and go down the old route, but what we essentially do is make sure that the residents don't continue to suffer because we couldn't be bothered to put a TRO and restrict a weight limit. So I think there is a little bit we could do, and it certainly I'd ask the officer to look into that. Maybe we could strengthen the conditions, councillors, I don't yeah. know. I, I'd, I'd maybe refer to a bit more local knowledge with, with councillors that are more familiar. But I do think there's a little bit further we could go than we'll wait and see where the problem breaks out. If it's in the wrong place, we can always change the TRO. We can't, you know, it's not we can't back out of them. That was a question. And that's something that obviously I can take back uh, following this meeting uh, back to our uh, traffic management team who deal with TROs um, and put them and, and let them have, start having a look at the, the issues and, and start looking at, at some solutions. We ask that they negotiate with Ward. I don't, yeah, I should think that's fair enough. Um, Are you happy with that? I think that's a separate issue. So if you want to have that agreement between you, that seems like a separate issue that could be picked up with involvement with ward members. Right. Uh, did I see? Oh, Councillor Cooper. And the... Thanks, Chair. Um, you may stop me saying this, Chair, but. You know, we, we, we've got these increasing problems. This is a question to the highways officer again, I'm sorry. But it, it links up to the other problems in the village and it all needs looking at all at the same time because we've got the 18,000 DHL lorry movements down Stripe Road, which is snarling up the village. So I think the entire traffic movement in the village needs reassessing. I cannot cure the DHL problem. I've had three meetings, but all this ties up. So I would welcome an approach from the highways officers for us to meet to try and resolve the overall problem. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, but that, that's a statement and is not part of this application. It's something um, that has to be taken up separately. Uh, Councillor Shaw. Thanks. Um, just, I just wanted to double check. The, currently, the lorry park, um, at what's the, lo the current lorry park's capacity and what's its current usage? Does that, do you know at all? The lorry park is a temporary solution to lorries getting them off the highway at this stage. In terms of capacity, I wouldn't know without checking, but it's in the region of around 20 spaces. Um, I don't have any data on whether that's fully occupied at any one time. My concern is that if currently there's 20 spaces, and, the, and the, I don't know whether anybody would, would be able to you know, tell me, if there's currently 20 spaces and they are fully occupied and we're looking at this site doubling in capacity and there's only 20 spaces provided on the uh, new site, then what, what is it that's going to mitigate or turn the trucks around quicker or whatever? I'm, 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 really, I'm really concerned. I'm really, really concerned. It, it, I've just asked a question. I'm really concerned that there may be a continuation of the use of the illegal lorry park if the capacity is not right on the new site. Is the, is, the, is the capacity greater on the new site than the current capacity for stacking trucks? I think it should be double because the double, the double in the amount of waste that they're taking in. I don't stack, the figures don't seem to add up. 
the lorry park came into fashion because of the arrangement where all HGV traffic was travelling down or up Bankwood Lane, which in itself is, in modern day standards, insufficient to carry that quality or that amount of traffic and its narrow nature was leading to issues where they were stacking up on Bankwood Lane, Bank and uh, uh, Western Lane. I can't give you any evidence, and I think it's also hypothetical to say that Lorry Park is in operate is is fully occupied at all times. So it's not it's not been the case when I visited on various occasions, but that's anecdotal evidence. The solution under this application is purpose built to provide you know a good amount of lorry parking within the site, and as Wayne mentioned, by moving the Waybridge out, there is a certain queue time to lead in time, if you like, to to get into the site as well. The, also, the site is more legible than it is at the moment, so where at the moment lorries are sort of parked ad hoc within the site to be unloaded, and then waste is sorted in various piles. This provides a more dedicated layout where, if you like, there's a more organic route through the site, so lorries are dealt with more efficiently. So I, I don't accept that the, we are simply transferring a problem from the lorry park to the current site, albeit there is, you know, there is an expanded capacity. That capacity, um, only comes after the infrastructure is in place to handle that amount of waste being delivered to the site, as shown in the report. Uh, <laughs> Got it now. Yeah, yeah. It's for the officer. Obviously, uh, this uh, site, um, part of the site, is in green belt, and therefore it is inappropriate development in the green belt. And part of that site is going to be used for the for the lorry park. So you know, uh, what my, my, one of my questions is: What's going to happen to the lorry park at the moment? If we, if this passes today, will that lorry park be closed, or what, what's the owner's preferred option on that? And don't you think, as one of my colleagues said, that we should have a weight limit on that road? In terms of the status of the lorry park, Atero made it very clear they don't want it any more than, than anybody does, residents, uh, ourselves. The status is that we're members minded to approve this application, that we would come back with, an, with the lorry park application to planning committee for a time limited temporary period to cover the construction phase of the link road and the lorry park. This, all being well, the the, as I said, the uh, development is weighted towards providing the link road and the lorry park first within the site. Once that becomes operational, the applicant has said that the lorry park will close. In the submission, the construction phase of the link road and lorry park is, is actually quite short. And they put 12 weeks. I think that might be a bit too short. So I anticipate we come back with a shorter resolution for the lorry park, say six months, you know, to be agreed. However, you know, it depends on the outcome of this application. What I would say is that the lorry park application is held in abeyance pending this application. This is the reason why we've continued to entertain it. So we're, you know, if this application isn't successful, then we wouldn't entertain the lorry park either. Yeah, um, leaving the traffic uh, question behind you, um, if this scheme is to progress, if it gets approved, um, I'd like to see amendments to the landscaping and tree requirements. In paragraph 11 in the conditions, there's only one paragraph relating to a tree survey and the landscape plan. Now, in one of the other applications, page 77, paragraph 7 and 8, the conditions are far more stringent. I would like to see the condition 11, I would like to see condition 11 just relate to the tree survey in accordance with British Standard 5837. They should require that immediately. And then I would like the paragraphs 7 and 8 add in, please. And because of the um, controversy over this scheme, I would also like to see the new landscape scheme um, immediately become the subject of a tree preservation order. What generally happens with developers, um, residents, when they take the houses over the move in, after five years, when the planning condition lapses, the trees are taken out. Uh, people don't want them in the gardens anymore. The gardens are far too small for some trees. And similarly, this authority does not have the staff to go around policing every landscape scheme. And all that's happening is our treescape is being denuded. 
Atero took out an edge on that side, which they shouldn't have done. Um, if this goes ahead, I would like to see a TPO put on as soon as the landscaping is carried out. And I will be asking that for as a norm in the future, so that we do we have the power to make everybody replant. It can't continue with this uh, rate of attrition on trees and shrubs. Thanks, Chair. Just to come back on that, uh, Councillor Cooper, Condition 11, uh, at the back end of the condition, it says any tree or shrub planted in accordance with the scheme and becoming damaged, diseased, dying or removed within five years of planting shall be replaced in accordance with the above document. So there is five years capacity there for the planning authority to ensure any tree removed is, is uh, replaced. I want them in perpetuity. I want a tree preservation order placed on it. I will be putting this proposal forward to the council that all new landscape schemes are TPO'd. We are losing far too many. We, we can't police every landscape scheme. And this one in my village, I'm asking for it to be TPO'd. Please. Thanks, Chair. The TPO, as you know, um, as a tree officer, I believe, previously, is a completely separate process. So we can't amend this condition on the basis that this is what we want on every application. It would have to be considered each tree on its merits and for the amenity of the area. So I think that's a separate issue to pick up as well. Um, if you would like a longer period than five years, and that's something that could be looked at in perpetuity, I think potentially is too long. No, Chair, any tree can be TPO'd. And that's what I'm asking for, not a planning condition. I want the trees TPO'd the moment they're planted. Any tree can be TPO'd. Once that tree goes in the ground, it can be the subject of a preservation order. Shrubs are a different kettle of fish. Residents can take them out, but the trees can actually be the subject of a TPO. Once they're planted, they're fair game for a tree preservation order. You can, you can, go, you can go back year upon year and, and miss things that's died, whereas if it all corresponds to the landscape plan, and what happens here is as well, Developers do not follow the landscape plan chair. They come and plant any rubbish what they want off Joe Bloggs and his one man dog band off the street corner. I don't want Doncaster having a reputation of having the rubbish trees dumped on it. I didn't accept it as the council's tree officer, so I don't want us to accept it now. I want some good quality stock going back in, otherwise we're robbing the next three generations. And I will keep harping on on this one. I do appreciate your passion, Councillor Cooper, uh, for trees. I, I, I sincerely do. The, the condition before us, uh, condition 11, requires the details of the landscaping scheme to be produced and approved in conjunction with the local planning authority. That will be done with the tree officer. The condition then requires those trees to be planted uh, and that any, any trees that become damaged, diseased, dying or are removed within five years are replaced. I think, as my colleague Heidi has said, the tree preservation order issue is a separate thing to, a, to, a, to the planning application condition before us. If those trees at the point of getting planted are then subjected to a TPO, then so be it. But we can't be enforcing that or asking for that as part of this condition at this moment in time. This is just ensuring a scheme is devised, it is put into the ground, and then whatever happens after that will, will flow from that. Right. Um. Is there a maximum, Chair, that I can actually ask for that five years to be extended to, then? Um, not, not on this application. It's a, it's a, separate, uh, a separate item. No, Chair, um, sorry, with respect, I think we've got five years on the, on the cards at the moment. Yes. I think the question is, what would be, can, we, can we amend that to 25 years? Because it's nothing more than a condition change. Uh, yeah, essentially, um, you'll know the six tests, so conditions need to be reasonable. Um, that is subjective. So if you think 25 years is reasonable, then that is something that I think you're entitled to do. Question to If, if I may indulge, if I may chip in, given my, my, uh, my experience in dealing with uh, uh, minerals applications over the years and so forth, when we have asked for uh, extended periods of time for uh, uh, looking after trees once they've been planted, previous 
tree officers have advised me that it's 15 years uh, that allows uh, time for the trees to actually get established and so forth. So I do know from other examples that 15 years are, are, are normally looked at. Can we have to 15? I'll run with the 15 years, <laughs> Chair, but I will pursue the TPO issue as a separate item. Thank you. If you would, please. Um, I'd like to ask, um, are we any further forward and are they going to be able to use? On this application, it says some of the um, end product, shall we say, is going to be moved by rail. Um, are we sure or are we sort of stuck in a rut with network rail? Because, uh, you know, to, um, I mean, will it become a fact is what I'm asking. Uh, yes, they are, and they have been trialling a rail operation for some time. Uh, there is some information on like, the expansion of that, and I'll just find it. Bear with me. At present, according to the submitted information, and this is going back eight months, the one train is removed. Well, one train loads worth of waste is removed from site each week. The train has capacity for around 900 tonnes. Um, further in the submission, it, take, it says that that has the potential to grow exponentially, depending on agreement with Network Rail. Um, but at least tripling is, I think, the information that I saw over a period of a few years, but it's still in a very early stage of development, but subject to Network Rail's agreement, they are looking to expand via rail, and that's purely to take waste out of the site. To delegate authority to the Assistant Director of Development to grant subject to approval by the Secretary of State as subject to the conditions. Um, do I have a mover for that? Councillor Durant? Can I just check, Chair, if that's in relation to the, 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 the amended, amended condition? Yeah, yeah. With, the, uh, with the amended condition of, of 15 years. I had uh, Councillor Durant and Councillor Healy seconded. Um, I'll have put, put that to you then, those in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you. Um, those who've come for the, um, that application, if anyone's leaving, could be sure to leave the agendas on the uh, chairs. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, you, you, you want a, 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 a comfort stop? Um, yes, um, I'll adjourn it till three o'clock, so scamper on. <laughs>
Right, ladies and gentlemen, we will reconvene this meeting and we move to application number two. It is 18-00702. It's for tipping waste and waste disposal at Hazel Lane Quarry, Wakefield Road, Hampole. And Roy Sykes is the presenting officer. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just for members' information, normally the presenting officer sits over there. Uh, and it would have been Richard Purcell who would sit here and take questions at a more senior level, but I'm the, I've been the case officer for this application for, for a number of years, and as such I'm going to remain sat here uh, to take any questions and so forth, but to do the presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, just by way of looking at the pre-committee amendments, there are two speakers, uh, the agent uh, speaking in support, uh, and Mick Balliger, who's here representing Hampole and Scalebrook Parish Council in opposition. Uh, some additional information is, is laid out there. Uh, key highlights are, since the report was prepared, there's been further removal of sterifiber from the site. Uh, we've received an uh, Environment Agency Compliance Assessment Report uh, from the Environment Agency. Uh, and I've received a further email from the Hampole and Scalebrook Parish meeting just asking for some points just to be uh, uh, made more uh, explicit uh, there, there for your information. Uh, the application has been presented to the Planning Committee as a result of the previous uh, involvement by the Planning Committee in this matter and as a result of the pending enforcement action in relation to the unauthorised storage of sterifibre at this site. Members will recall that sterifiber began to be imported on the site as far back as 2008 without the benefit of planning permission and that the 2010 retrospective application that sought to retain the padding stockpile was refused permission due to concerns over the Greenbelt impact. This decision was appealed as too was the enforcement notice and the inspector went on to dismiss both appeals. The company who was producing the waste, Stericycle, subsequently went into administration and since 2012 no further Sterifiber has been imported to the site. Since this time the Planning Committee uh, has had a number of uh, updates presented to them on the lack of progress in removing Sterifiber from the site and up until earlier this year the Planning Authority was due to give evidence at a public inquiry in relation to the most recently refused application which was eventually withdrawn and the current application before you submitted. Fundamentally, this application proposes the uh, initial removal of 16,000 tonnes of sterifiber over a two-year period. Opportunities for further deployments are to be explored within the six-year period applied for, as to is the potential for use of a small proportion of sterifiber on site for restoration purposes. The use of sterifiber on site, however, is to be explored as part of the upcoming mineral review, which is due early next year. Until this has been concluded, sterifiber cannot be used on site by virtue of condition 29 of the quarry permission, which prevents the use of soil making materials being used on site for restoration purposes without first gaining written consent from the planning authority. And no consent has been given. In terms of location, the sterifiber stockpile, just go back a second Dave, sorry, uh, the sterifiber stockpile is located within the active limestone quarry and landfill known locally as Hazel Lane Quarry. The permission for the quarry and landfill endures until 2034, by which time the site is to have been worked, landfilled and restored in accordance with the approved plans. The stockpile itself is located towards the southeast of the site in the area shown by the cross hatching and the area of the quarry landfilling permission is shown by the diagonal lines. To the west lies the A638 Doncaster Wakefield Road, and to the south and east is Hazel Lane. Next slide, please. This aerial photo gives an indication of the landscape context in which the sterifiber stockpile and pad resides. Whilst the area is washed over by Greenbelt, it is clear to see from this photo that the context is one of a heavily disturbed quarry workings and landfilling operation with numerous stockpiles of materials. The village of Hampole lies to the south and Skelbrook lies to the northeast. The stockpile is stored on a purpose-built pad which has been constructed with the Environment Agency's approval. The pad is principally a subsurface structure to a depth of approximately four to five metres with a small upstanding bund surrounding it. Within the confines of the bund is a collection of leachate that accumulates as a result of the water runoff from the pile. 
This photo, provided by the applicant in their planning submission, gives a good indication of the surrounding landscape context of the sterifiber stockpile in terms of the encompassing quarry faces, landfill cells, stockpiles of materials, other buildings and structures. The photo will have changed today, given the sterifiber has now started to be removed from the site, with a resultant reduction in both the height and volume of sterifiber. This next slide. This shows the more up-to-date position of the stockpile with a significantly reduced amount of sterifiber. In terms of removal, sterifiber is first tested for aerobic conditions, uh, which are likely to be less odorous, before being dozed off the top of the stockpile and onto the loading area. From here, it is loaded into heavy goods vehicles, which are then sheeted before being exported from the site. This activity is being carried out in line with the site's environmental permit specifically in relation to the older management plan governing the site. Currently, sterifiber is being transported to a permitted site in Bassett Law. Since early 2000, August 2018, a total of 2,474 tonnes of sterifiber has now been removed from site. This is the first removal of sterifiber from the site in six years. Visits by the Local Planning Authority and the Environment Agency have raised no issues with the removal in terms of amenity impacts and no odour complaints have been reported. With the reduction in sterifiber, the situation today in terms of greenbelt impact are accordingly reduced in terms of both volume and visual impact, and the detail of which is given in the report. The proposal is still deemed by definition to be inappropriate development in the greenbelt, given the change of use sought for the retention of the stockpile and the very presence of it, which results in encroachment. The planning balance is presented in the report for members and significant to outweighing the substantial protection afforded to Greenbelt is the significant weight afforded to the sustainable reuse of this material as required by national waste policy in relation to the waste hierarchy principles, along with the temporary nature of the proposal and the reduction in the visual impact of the stockpile in relation to its surrounding heavily industrialized context. Officers do not, however, feel that a period of six years as applied for is a tenable situation, given that half of the stockpile pile will be removed within two years. Accordingly, two conditions are recommended to ensure sterifiber is continued to be removed should permission be granted. One condition requires the removal of at least 16,000 tonnes within two years, which is detailed within the application submission. The other requires the remaining stockpile and pad to be removed within three years, these conditions meet the necessary tests. In conclusion, no harm has been identified through the technical consultees, such as the Environment Agency, Environmental Health, Pollution Control and Highways, and on balance is recommended for approval subject to conditions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We have two speakers. Um, Mr Chris Ballam, is he here? Yes. Would you like to come down to the front, Mr Ballam? Um, Press the big red button when you wish to speak and you have up to five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, right, the, as um, Mr Sykes has said, the sterifiber stockpile has been at the quarry for some time now. And this is because of the lack of places to take it to. Um, this sort of waste material is produced constantly by people like Yorkshire Water and more modern um, waste recyclers. These operations are under constant pressure to get their waste materials off-site, so they're willing to pay quite high gate fees to, to, um, to, to various sites to where they can use the materials, whereas with Sterifiber, once Stericycle uh, was out of the picture, uh, there was no finance av available to, uh, to pay the gate fees. So people like Yorkshire Water and the major recyclers are willing to pay almost any cost to get their material away from their site so it doesn't build up. Um, and that price is um, people like my client out of the marketplace as it were um, but we've been able to identify a site in Welbeck in North Nottinghamshire and that's the situation that's changed this is a colliery reclamation scheme 
um, which needs material like stereofiber in order to use it as a soil um, dressing material to add um, organic matter and moisture retention properties to um, sand and other materials that they've got um, for use on, on a um, recreational restoration scheme for tree planting and grass growth um, and they can they working through the site so they only have a relatively small area any one time where it can be spread um, so they're willing to take quantities of material over an extended period of time it's not too far to travel and the costs of taking it there can be spread out over that period of time rather than undertake them all at once and you'll appreciate that it's a very expensive thing to do to transport this material 30 odd miles to to North Nottinghamshire. Um, the key point of the planning application is the enforcement notice is a bit like a sword of Damocles hanging over my client they're going to undertake a contract over a period of years to remove the material when the council can at any time put a stop to it means it's very difficult to enter into any sort of contract so in order to fulfill a contract we need some ability to plan for the future hence the application which is time limited we are now approaching 10% of the stockpile having gone off to, to Welbeck. It will slow down when the weather gets wet because the receiving site can't cope with it when it's wet and we can't take it off site when it's wet. So it, it is uh, very weather dependent. I must emphasize that this is the only site we've been able to find in the, in the last Eight, six to eight years which has been able to take the material and which it's affordable for my client to take it there um, we could use it on tree planting areas at Hazel Lane um, if that's allowed by the council and currently these are the only two things places that we can use the material um, and we do need that assurance of a number of years to give us a chance to take it off site. Thank you. Any questions of Mr. Ballam? Yes, Councillor Wood. Thank you, Mr. Ballam, for your presentation. Sorry, questions. This is a difficult bit. Um, I, I just, I, I've got quite a few questions. Unfortunately, I won't have time to ask them all of you, and I, I think there's obviously other speakers as well. But quite, quite clearly, this is an application which will hinge on whether there are very special circumstances, because those are the only things that allow you to do what you want to do in the green belt. That has been irrelevant to you in the past, and you've done it, and that's why you've been to appeal and lost it, tried to go to a public inquiry, withdrawn from it. And the other 10 years of history which have seen this site illegally store this stuff or without the permits that should have been in place apart from I accept that you've got an environmental permit to do it but planning permission is differently now with regard to the very special circumstances you talked about there about a sword of Damocles hanging over you you know uh, and the idea that that you know maybe there are these special circumstances because the pile has reduced uh, I question whether you will be able to get rid of all of it. You've only put in here to be able to talk about 50% of it. So essentially your, your argument is about giving us permission to go further. So my first question is, what would stop you applying again and again for, for further extensions to this if it doesn't go? And that, bear in mind it hasn't gone anywhere in 10 years. The second question is associated with the idea that it's affordable. You as well as I and everybody else in this committee know that affordability is nothing to do with a material planning concern. So it's of no concern to us as a committee how much it's going to cost your client to put right the wrong. So I'd like you to answer that. And the third issue is associated with the idea that it could be used at Hazel Lane. We are compelled to look at the application 
before us. I'm glad you've admitted, because it is a matter of public record, that there are two other applications that are outstanding from your client to actually spread this locally at Hazel Lane, and yet that hasn't been mentioned by the officer because you know full well it can't be. The question to you, therefore, as you've mentioned it, is, you know, if it goes to, uh, the stereofiber goes to be spread at Hazel Lane, talk to us a little bit about what that would do to prime agricultural land that would have been taken out of. Because you make it sound as if this is good stuff. It sterilises the land that it sits on without public access, without the ability to use as agricultural land. It is plastic being spread in the environment. What part of that is reasonable that I am missing? Ocean rescue, sky, all of it. We all recognise that plastic is wrong. What part am I missing that all of a sudden spreading plastic in soil for eternity is, is something that's to be endorsed as part of a waste strategy? So there's three questions there. Right. Um, if I can deal with the, th the last point first. Um, the material is, if it's going to be used at Hazel Lane, um, we are now proposing to use it on the tree planting areas where it will not be disturbed. It will be incorporated within the subsoil, it will not be in the topsoil, so it won't be on the surface and there is no reason why any wildlife or people can wander about. It's exactly the same situation at Welbeck, which is a recreational area where um, as far as I'm aware, Nottinghamshire County Council welcomed its use because it's um, a suitable material. It's also been used in Barnsley on reclamation sites where there are people um, walking about on the surface again, as far as I am know. Um, and that was on, on a site that was restored by Barnsley Council itself. So most local authorities appear to accept it as a reasonable material. Um, Affordability, I accept that in normal circumstances, uh, that's not strictly speaking a planning criteria, Th the only means of getting rid of this material very quickly is to landfill it. That would invite three million pound landfill tax payment which would bankrupt the company. Nobody's going to take on a site with a three million pound um, potential liability so the net effect of that will be the stereofiber will stay there for as long as you care to imagine. So in this instance, affordability is an important point. Um, forgive me, I've forgotten. <laughs> that was the second point, I think. The first point was, can you remind me of what that was? Those are, and I've got supplementaries as well, Chair, so I'm going to come back, but just to remind you on the first question, it was associated with, and you know, I accept what you've said, there are reasons. What I'm asking for are what are the very special circumstances, because those are the only things that are material here. So far you've talked about reducing the amount and the affordability, which is irrelevant to this argument. What I'm asking for are what are the very special circumstances? The material is there, something has to be done with it. If you refuse planning permission for it and carry on doing so, the likelihood is that it will stay there. So <laughs> to use the rather hackneyed phrase, something must be done in order to remove it. Um, so I think the very special circumstances, if they are indeed applicable in this case, are that the material has to be removed it's already there, we're not planning to take it there, and there are good reasons for not throwing it in a landfill. One is the cost, and the other that's a total waste of a material that can be used. Um, th those, I think, are the basic um, circumstances around that. Supplementary Chair, I I've not made my mind up yet, but it doesn't put me in a good frame of mind when you tell me that the very special circumstances for this to be allowed to be allowed is entirely based on the fact that your client brought it there having not sought planning permission to do it in the first place. Because that's essentially what you've told me. You, you, you know yourself over 10 years that this was a, you know, it was a waste transfer station, all these other things that go with it. But fundamentally, your client brought it on site. It's now sat there. 
He's found it very difficult to remove it, which is plainly obvious, you know, because nobody else wants this. And I, I, I'd come back to you on other uses. I, I, think, I think we'll examine that a little bit later. But with regard to that, you know, again, what are the very special circumstances? Because your client, having brought the material to the site or been party to a deal that saw this stuff arrive at the site, and there's lots of it, we, again, we don't know whether it's 20, 30, or 40 cubic 40,000 cubic meters that are there, and I've got some questions for the officer, but the bottom line is very special circumstances are not my client brought it there and therefore it's going to sit there otherwise, because that is tantamount to, I mean, talk about the sword of Damocles, that, you know, that, 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 that goes beyond that. So again, final question, what are the very special circumstances? Because they are not your client, not upholding what he should have done in the first place. I think, Councillor, we are where we are. The past has happened. We can't do anything about that. Um, the rights and wrongs of doing so are quite clearly laid out in, in an enforcement notice. Um, but we cannot do nothing. So we have to be entirely practical about it. We have a means of getting the majority, well, 50% of the material off-site. Um, Welbeck is a long-term site. We're only dealing with the next two years. It might well be that it will take more material, but at the moment we don't know. So there is every prospect of the story fibre going, but only over an extended period of time. Um, and I think really we have enough special circumstances there to, to justify a grant of permission. Thank you. Chair, can I just state a matter of point of order here? This is an application to retain the stereo fiber and the pad. This is not an application to remove. With all respect, the applicant makes it sound here as if this is an application to remove it. No permission is required to put the job right and remove it and take it away. And I hate to say it, the agent here seems to be making it as if this is an application to remove it. No permission is required to remove it. They should be doing that. They've got an enforcement notice against them to do that and to make anybody believe that this is an application to remove Sterifiber. It's not. It's to give them more time. That's all it is, having been given 10 years and having, you know, having this thing. So I think that, that just needs stating for the record, if that's okay, Chair, because otherwise we, you know, we run the risk of misleading members. Uh, yes, uh, th uh, thanks for that, Mr. Bond. Uh, just something you said uh, the, uh, about the uh, the usage uh, of it. You said, uh, if if I'm correct, uh, you said most of the councils are using it and they're happy to use it. Would that be would, would that be where, where it has been used? Um, it's been used on reclamation schemes, and most of those, um, apart from Welbeck, um, have been either um, the re reclamation of landfill sites or on council restoration schemes like the one in Barnsley. Um, but the one in North Nottinghamshire is, a, is an ex-colliery site, um, but it has the support of Nottinghamshire County Council. So those authorities have been happy with its use. Um. I'm just, I'm just wondering, you know, you're saying that they're, they're happy to use it. Uh, if they're so happy to use it, why, why is uh, your client having difficulty getting rid of it? Because the sites haven't been available to my client. There aren't that many reclamation schemes, colliery reclamation schemes left, um, as, as I'm sure you'll be aware of. Um, and I did point out the fact that there are other... Um, businesses that produce waste on a daily basis like Yorkshire Water with sewage sludge like um, the big recycling companies um, who handle black bin waste and so on there's a lot of material that comes from them and they have to get that waste material off site otherwise it continues to pile up so they're willing to pay a high cost to get it off site because the costs of not getting it on off site are even higher. So they outbid anybody else in, in paying the gate price to 
which is what you have to do um, in order to get the material used. So there is quite fierce competition in, in this sort of area. I think it was uh, Councillor Cooper, then I've got uh, Councillor Anderson and Councillor Shaw. Thanks, Chair. I've got a few questions, and rather than just read them all out for Mr. Bollam to remember, if I could just roll on with them if he asks them, if that's okay. Uh, I think you've used an unfortunate term of phrase there, uh, Mr. Bollam, in that most authorities use it. You've, you've mentioned Barnsley and North Nottingham. They're in fact somewhat like 450 local authorities, so I don't think two is most of them. Um, could you tell me how long Steady Fibre has been about? How many years? I might have missed that in the opening speeches. Um, well, Sterifiber came from the Stericycle operation at Rotherham, which took Doncaster, Rotherham and Barnsley's waste. So indeed, the Sterifiber, a good part of it, is Doncaster's own waste. Um, it started being taken onto site, I believe, in about 2008. Um, and it ceased when Sturry Fibre went bust in 2012, I think Mr. Sykes said, I can't remember precisely. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I mean, that's a relatively short life um, to prove anything in the terms of it being useful for tree planting, etc. Anything with trees is long term by its very nature, as I'm sure you'll understand. Um, I've never come across it being used as a soil enhancement. Uh, and it certainly doesn't look an attractive proposition to me um, for tree planting. Um, so I, can, I know of no other authority that's used this. I've certainly never used it, um, and it doesn't look, sort of look like something that I would use. Um, going on to another point, um, you mentioned in the timescales for moving the steri fibre that you sort of inferred that if planning permission wasn't granted, it has sort of be there as long as you can imagine. I mean, it's already been there for about 10 years, so um, I, I dread to think that it's going to be there another 10 years. Um, I'll, I'll have to ask the next part of this of the officers later, Chair. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah. Um, Councillor Anderson. As has been pointed out, this permission, you're seeking permission to keep the stereo fibre on site or a portion of it. What will you do if permission is refused and you are not allowed to keep this on site? How will you go about removing how will your client sorry go about removing it? Well we <laughs> we would continue to take the material off to Welbeck. Um but the problem that we've got is that it's fully within the council's power to prosecute. Um, and as my client is unable to dispose of it instantly, um, it's fully open to for fines to be imposed, um, presumably, and we were speculating here, up to the point where it becomes unaffordable. And that's it for the company. So it's up, to, it's up to the council, really. It either grants permission or doesn't enforce the enforcement notice in order to allow them the, the movement to go on. But it isn't very comfortable, as, as I would imagine that you, you see, for my client to sit there with having to enter into contracts to do things but with no security over the length of time over which it can operate it effectively nullifies any contract that you might want to sign so if we're down to that it reduces the likelihood of the material going off site for that reason because there's no security that any contract entered into could be adhered to so just to see if I've got this right, you're saying even if we refuse your client permission to keep the sterifiber on site, he's going to keep the sterifiber on site regardless and hope we don't enforce or just accept the fines? It seems pretty bull. There is an outstanding enforcement notice requiring the material to go. Um, so it's got to go. 
Um, we have found a means of taking almost half of it off-site um, over a two-year period. Um, but we can only we can only enter into that contract if we've got security for that two-year period and there is no security without the planning permission. So we're taking a chance on carrying on um, and it's open to the council at any time to take enforcement action but the council must realise the practicalities of, of doing that um, and it might well be that one of the outturns is the enforcement action is followed through and the material does not go off site, it remains on site because it cannot, it can, it's unaffordable to take it off site over a very short period because the only means of doing that is into landfill. You're landfilling a usable material which doesn't have to be landfilled, i.e. thrown away and you immediately pay three million pounds in landfill tax to do so which is going to bankrupt anybody um, associated with it. So that, that, those are the practicalities of this. With respect, your client created this situation. It's not like he's found himself with this stuff on his land. He brought this here. It's not our job to make that a sexual business prospect for him. So if enforcement action was taken, he would have to remove it. What I'm saying to you, basically, if you take enforcement action, it will bankrupt the operator. Nobody would take on a site with a £3 million liability, so the stereo fibre is likely to stay. So we're dealing in practicalities here. Um, I appreciate what you're saying, um, but we've, we need to find a means of getting this material off-site. And it has to be affordable so that it can be done. If it's not affordable, it can't be done. That, that's it in a nutshell. Um, as everybody, I've got a couple of questions. Um, firstly, you said that people like Yorkshire Water and a number of other industries produce um, material that is, you know, uh, they're willing to pay more to, to dispose of it, and this is a problem. But I'm right in understanding that the other materials that are produced by other industries is not stereo fibre, is it? That's a, it's not being produced. Stereo fibre is not being produced anymore by anyone and it's not being used on, an, on any sites currently other than the, this, this that we're talking about. I would hope nobody's producing it anymore. <laughs> we, we've gone on a long way, a long um, movement forward with waste recycling since the um, mid to late um, 2000s. Um, but th this was a council contract this was done for Doncaster Council, for Rotherham Council, for Barnsley Council, using the best technology available at the time. And, and so, and I, I would suggest that BDR knew it was going to Hazel Lane, they sanctioned it, so, and that was part of the council, Doncaster Council. So there's all sorts of blame to be applied in, in this, of which some of it is on part of my client who, who arguably shouldn't have accepted it in the first place. We don't wish to... No, it's, it's not a planning matter. It's not a planning issue, councillor. Okay, I mean, just to, to address that, you know, I'm not interested in, in the sense of how we got this stuff personally. You know, as the, as the saying goes, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. And I'm afraid, unfortunately, uh, you know, fools often look for an easy solution. And I think uh, anybody with any common sense would have seen that this was never viable from the start. But as you say, we are where we are. So, um, so sewage sludge and other types of materials that have been produced and people are willing to pay far more for to dispose of are a different matter out of the sewage sludge is, is, uh, is different, it is a soil improver. So what I don't understand about this particular product is, if it's a soil improver, why on the Welbeck um, site is it not being put in the soil? It's been put in the subsoil. 
So it, it, you, I, don't, I don't understand that because if it's a soil improver and it's this wonderful, wonderful stuff, and given that it, it, they don't want to use it as a soil, they want to use it as a cap in, and then they're overlaying it obviously with the soil because obviously it's not a soil improver. Why are Welbeck willing to take it when? There's better products available and people are willing to pay more for it. I don't, it seems like a bit of a bad business move to me on their part. Um, I don't know, um, although they're also a client of mine, I, I don't know the reasons why they are taking it rather than anything else. I, um, I, and I can't really speculate on that. Um, it, it is standard practice to add this sort of material into the top layer of subsoil, um, not into the not into the topsoil. This type of material, I, 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 we, we need to keep define where we are. This type of sewage sludge is not sterifiber. You know, sterifiber is sterifiber. It's a very unique material. So this type of material, I, I, I think we can, you know, you're crossing over and kind of foot, well, footing's probably a bit unfair, but, you know, it, it's, I think it's a bit disingenuous. Councillor Shaw, yes. yeah. we're not into deciding what the rights and wrongs of what another council are doing with it. Um, it's, it is what it is. This stuff is going there and for which we're thankful. Um, unfortunately, it's not all of it, but we're not into why they're doing it and why they can take it um, and somebody else won't or can't. Major, I'm just trying to uh, explore the actual reality of half of this pile being taken. You know, uh, and that, and that, because that, the, the old application hinges on the fact it's been removed and whether the, it's a credible proposal that has been put forward is what I'm trying to explore. So I do think it's relevant if, 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 if that's all right. But I've, I've done with my questions now, so that's fine. Uh, yes, Mr. Bowling, uh, thank you. Um, obviously, when we're moving the stereo um, fibre, it, does it give it odour off? Because I know where, where I live, and I'm probably about three miles away from here, we, every now and again we do get a bad smell. And I'm just asking, is any odour given off when this is being removed? Um, there is an odour management plan in place which covers how it's removed. And the objective of that is that if there is an odour generated, then you stop. You don't, you don't move it. Um, the material has been moved since the 6th of August, I think it is. Um, we're approaching 3,000 tonnes, which, and remember, there's about 30 tonnes in a lorry load, so, so you can work out how many lorry loads that is. Um, we are not aware of any complaints about odour from the locality, and, in, and indeed, I don't think they knew about it until they were told about it about a month after it had started. Um, the Environment Agency offices and your own offices are quite satisfied that it isn't generating any significant odour when it's dug out and removed. So the, the answer is, if it's done in the correct manner, according to the approved way of, of dealing with it, then there is no odour issue. Thank you very much, Mr Ballam. Um, I have now uh, Nick Ballinger, who is from Hampshire and uh, Skelbrook Parish Council, who wishes to speak. Mr. Ballinger. Oh, sorry. I'm very sorry. Um, hmm. Could you? We've uploaded the, the photographs that you sent, so if you wish to refer to them, uh, you, they are on screen. You're going to put them full screen? That's it. Thank you. Um, right, and uh, you have up to five minutes. <clears throat> right, thank you. Good afternoon. My name's uh, Nick Balliger, and I'm the chairman of Hampole and Skelbrook uh, Parish Meeting. 
We're all relieved to see that after 10 years of this unauthorised storage, stereofibre is now finally being moved off site. And so far there have been no real local issues, but it is noted that stereofibre is still steaming and very smelly when you get close to it. Permission is again being sought here for the storing of stereofibre for six years, and this is for the third time. This has previously been rejected as inappropriate development in Greenbelt with no very special circumstances, twice by the authority most recently in 2015 and by the planning inspectorate in 2012. We are incredulous that this is being considered again and are losing faith in the system despite the excellent efforts of the planning committee over the last several years. We are told that there are important differences this time. As far as we can see, there is only one difference since 2015, when on the recommendation of the planning officer, the committee rejected a virtually identical planning application. This one difference is that the stockpile is now slightly smaller because cat plant has been compacting it by heavy rolling. And finally, the enforcement notice is being complied with after seven years of being in place. Nothing else has changed since then. The authority estimates the stockpile to, stockpile to be between 33,000 and 57,000 tonnes. Cat plant's plan during the next years is to reduce the stockpile by 21,000 tonnes, 16,000 tonnes off-site, 4,000 tonnes to be used on authorized, un, unauthorised steep slopes of their site this winter, and another 1,000 tonnes on new unauthorised steep slopes over the next six years. If this plan goes ahead, there will be between 9,000 and 32,000 tonnes left in the pile in six years' time. Again, cat plants plan includes spreading serifiber on their site, with the consequent loss of prime agricultural land, but this time on slopes, which are said to be too, sleep for, too steep for agricultural use. This part of their plan to reduce the pile requires separate planning permission, and so, far is, and so is far from guaranteed. The slopes around the edges of the restored part of the site are now so steep, typically one in four, compared with the one in 33 permitted. And the height is so great at over 70 metres above sea level, compared with the 50 to 55 permitted after settling, that the restored landform is far removed from what has, was originally approved. The site is in a very prominent and sensitive position in the landscape at the edge of the limestone plateau, and next to an area of special landscape value. When viewed from Hampole, it's beginning to look like a mountain and is out of keeping with the surroundings. The rest restoration of the site is starting to run out of control. If you want to show the other pictures um, to just demonstrate that, there's three of them that show how huge it's getting. Residents' views remain unchanged as to what we do not wish to see the site nor any part of it restored with sterifiber. Because firstly, sterifiber contains significant amounts of waste. Small pieces of glass and plastic, melted toothbrushes, small batteries and so on. It is well established that this will pose a significant risk to wildlife, mainly through ingestion of plastic. Secondly, the areas restored with sterifiber could not be returned to agricultural use and the permanent loss of prime agricultural land is not sustainable and conflicts with the original planning conditions. Thirdly, over many years of spreading, odour issues will persist and we've all been told that the long-term health effects of sterifiber are not known and some residents in Hampel suffered health issues in, the, in 2012 when we were at our peak of our movements, and it was investigated by the NHS at the time. The authority is now recommending granting of planning permission after having argued the complete opposite for the 2015 application and in, and in its submission for this year's cancelled public inquiry. Cat plant have asked for six years. You have just one minute. Thank you. Cat plant have asked for six years and have shown that they will probably need at least 12 years. The authority's recommendation is to give three years to remove all the stereopyber in the pad. This will be su subject to a scheme to show how this will be achieved, which is yet to be submitted by cat plant and then to be approved by the authority. In addition, at the end of three years, cat, cat plant could apply for more time. This is not credible and could go on forever. It strikes us the extant enforcement notice is the authority's trump card to keep cat plant focused. We would respectfully ask you to reject the planning applications you've done twice before, again on the grounds of inappropriate development in Greenbelt because it does not preserve its openness and demonstrably there are no very special, very special circumstances. Not one very special circumstance has been mentioned by the planning officer. Thank you very much for all your support over the years. Thank you. <laughs> right, please.
Councillor Wood. Oh, I do. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Dr. Ballager, for the, uh, the presentation. Just a, just a few questions. Obviously, the context here, and I appreciate your, your leniency here, Chair. The, the context clearly is that the applicant comes along with the idea that with my client's done what he's done. Forget about that. It's the here and now. Let's give him permission. Let's remove the sword of Damocles. I mean, that's, that's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sleep dreaming about that tonight. You know, let, let's remove the sword of Damocles because we where we are where we are, and otherwise he can't sign a contract. You know, I, I, am I wrong here, uh, uh, Doctor? Quite clearly, no permission is required to remove this from the site today, and yet the whole basis of this permission seems to be around we're going to use it to restore on the site, which has been, um, uh, the, the, the piles uh, of other stuff have been allowed to build up beyond the current planning permission. So we might even have a, I don't know, that might be an enforcement case separately anyway. But let's ignore that and let me to use that. So, 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 so that's the question about the Sword of Damocles. We've heard a lot about different estimates of size of fibre pile. And, and I, I've done my digging in the past. We were criticised last month for not doing digging and reading the background notes. I've come up with the fact that in 2015, it was estimated that there were 29,000 cubic metres on site. Now, a different estimate from somebody else came up with the idea that there was 37,000 cubic metres. And finally, there's another estimate that actually there was 38,000 cubic metres. And the officer, to be fair, and I'm going to come back and ask him, has now assumed that he wants to work with the fact that there are 33,000 cubic metres on site. Do you know how, many, uh, how big the pile is and what's on site? That's the second question. And the final one is, just to pick up on... You know, obviously we rejected very similar application in 2015, which subsequently went to public inquiry. That wasn't played out. The applicant's withdrawn. I hate to say it might seem like a bit of a trick that if he puts this application in now, that all goes away, and it has, lucky, lucky for him. However, there was a recommendation from the planning officer that we see here today to obviously deny that application. Can you give us your views on whether you think anything has changed? Because to be quite frank, having looked at this, and I'm going to go to the officer later on, but he's given a, a, a defence to the inspector which worked. The inspector backed him and gave very clear messages that it shouldn't be allowed in the green belt. He's now written a submission to go to the public inquiry which said that it shouldn't be allowed permission. And now, out of the blue, we have him sitting here before us, although I will say, because I don't want to insult Roy because he's a good officer, he has made it very clear that it's very finely balanced. I hate to say it from my perspective, it doesn't seem very finely balanced, but I appreciate he's got to maintain his professionalism. Could you comment on that, please? So there's three questions there for you. Okay, no, that's fine. I'll deal with the first one first because I think that's um, very clear. I mean, they do not need permission to take the material off-site, that is, fulfilling the terms of the enforcement notice, which for various reasons over the last seven years the authority has chosen not to enforce. And um, I don't share Chris Ballam's worries that perhaps they might decide to enforce it in the, any time soon. And certainly I don't think they would enforce it while material is being moved off-site because that's something that we all want to see because we want to see the problem uh, be taken away. Um, so, yes, they can continue to move it off-site, and with that sword hanging over them, that, to me, holding them t their feet to the fire is a much better way of getting to that ultimate resolution than to start going down this path again of temporary permissions, which can very easily be um, uh, extended, as uh, Roy said in, his, in this paper that is written for today, and you can extend it and then extend it again. Once you've opened that door, um, I think uh, you lose control. Secondly, with the uh, size of the pile, it's quite interesting that one of the, the big themes is that this pile is getting smaller. But if you um, look back, as Councillor Wood has just said, the Environment Agency did a big analysis of the size of the pile in 2014. They saw that the volume was 29,000 cubic metres and then did some estimates through weighings, I guess, of densities and came out with a pile of 23,000 to 40,000 tonnes. 
Um, this is all a matter of record, by the way, Roy, in your submission on the uh, public inquiry. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, Cat Plant did another survey in 2017 with their consultant, Silkstone. At the same time, Doncaster Council was there, um, or the planning department were there, with their consultants, SIMAS, which is South Yorkshire Mining Advisory Service, and the approximate volume was somewhere in the range 33,000 to 38,000 cubic meters. So actually, the pile seems to have grown in volume. So we've got a bigger pile now than we had three years ago, four years ago. Um, and then the weight, uh, cat plant, of course, assumed the lowest density that uh, was within the acceptable range of 0.8 tons per cubic meter. Um, the council's um, consultant said that actually there's no way you can use that lower density because it's been compacted by heavy rolling by cat plant. So they said that the density range that should be used should be in the range 1 to 1.5 tons per cubic meter, and that gives this big spread of 33,000 tons in the pile up to 57,000 tons. Now, nobody today, I think I'm right in saying until I've sat here, has said anything other than about 30 to 33,000 tons. And actually, there could be nearly double that there. We just don't know. But if there is double there, we've got an even bigger problem that we think we have. Okay, so that's I think that answers your second question, doesn't it, Councillor Wood? Got some uh, the third, I've got a third question yet. <laughs> I'll try and be a bit brief on this, but what changes have there been? Um, I think uh, the, the only change that there are in paragraph 8.4 in Roy's report, I think he says there are, there are five changes. But those changes um, have happened quite a long time ago like Sterifiber stopped supplying Sterifiber onto the site. That happened in 2012. We've had a planning application in 2015, and that wasn't considered something that was important in the decision in, in deciding to turn down the temporary permission. So I think we're left with um, just the fact that the, the pile is supposedly smaller, but we've just seen, well, actually, it might be a bit bigger for reasons that we don't understand. Maybe it's absorbed more water or whatever. And so the only other really real change is they've started to take it off site uh, to Welbeck Colliery where it's being used. Um, and that is conforming with an, an enforcement notice. And I think, um, as Roy has, has quite said in his planning balance, because it's being done under enforcement notice, he can't give that any weight in the planning balance. So it does, that in itself doesn't carry any weight. So what has changed since 2015 when this august body on the recommendation of the planning officer rejected a almost virtually identical planning application? I hope that answers that question. Yes, just keep it two I'll, questions. I'll try and keep it brief. So obviously, if I understand correctly, there's still lots of numbers being thrown out on sizes of the pile. It's been rolled, or maybe it's been rolled, maybe it's absorbed water, we don't know. But the point is that even with the officer's assumption of 33,000, it could actually be significantly more, which would make the time period to get rid of it. We'll, we're almost certainly going to have, in terms of the office recommendation to allow it for three years, it's absolutely certain going to be at least six, which is what the applicants forward, probably even more than that. So we're going to, this is never going to go away, even if we try and address it today, by allowing permission. Have I understood that correctly? And second of all is, you, 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 you raised something there that's quite interesting that, that nobody's spoken about really, and that was this thing about the planning balance. Um, and, and perhaps maybe you could elaborate on that. Uh, my interpretation of a planning balance is that, you know, we're talking about is it going to be a sustainable use? Is it, is it you know, has it got a visual impact? Well, we've see, we can see the mountain in the background on the horizon here, you know, and of course the planning inspector said it doesn't matter whether you can see it, you can see it, but he said it doesn't matter whether you can see it, the fact that it is there gives you reason to, to, you know, uphold an appeal, and that's why he backed us on our previous, our previous things. So, members, I think we should be aware of that. And finally, the issue of waste hierarchy and, and, and that planning balance, 
you know, are it, maybe I've missed something here, and I've asked the other presenters about this, but is it really the case that people think that a sustainable use of waste for plastic and batteries, and I think you said toothbrushes and other stuff, that it's really sustainable if we just dump that? And I know people will say they're making soil with it, but I don't subscribe to that. But, you know, is, have I misread it here? Is that what we're talking about? We are essentially adding plastic to the environment to which we should be protecting. Have I, am, I, am I on the right course here, or am I, am I down the wrong hole? Put me thing on right. Um, no, I could never say you were down the wrong hole, uh, Councillor Wood. Um, <laughs> I, it's interesting, this the high plastic and glass content that there is within this. Uh, it looks fairly innocuous when you talk about it in percentage terms. And I was looking this morning at uh, refreshing myself of when they'd done all the initial analysis of when they were producing um, Sterifiber at Stericycle. And the c total contaminant level, on average, uh, from a number of samples, that's contaminants greater than two millimeter in size, is about 3.9% on average. It varied between 1.7% and 6.7%. Well, it doesn't sound too, in, too huge, that. I mean, it's obviously a reasonable percentage. But when you, you take the middle number of 3.9%, and if they were to spread the 5,000 tons on the slopes at the site, that means there will be 200 tons of contaminants spread on that site. And if you look at the plastic within it, the plastic within that 3.9% uh, is 1.3%. So that means there would be 65 tonnes of plastic spread on the slopes of that site. And, I mean, as a complete aside, I think the Environment Agency has completely lost the plot on stuff like this. They are so absolutely focused on trying to get waste recycled that they're absolutely contaminating everything else, and it, it's beyond me. Um, so I hope that answers your question about... Uh, the size of the pile, that, that, you know, again, am I missing it, or do we really not know? Of the size of the pile? Sorry, I thought I'd... Uh, I'll come back to that again. We don't know. It's somewhere between 30,000 and 57,000 tonnes. Um, and um, we'll only find out when, when it's actually, uh, when we get into it. Because don't forget, this pile has been 10 or 15 metres high from top to bottom. The bottom has been sitting in liquid for a long time, which has been recirculated over the top of the pile. You would expect the bottom half of this pile, the bit that sits in the ground, you know, you heard earlier that it was four to five metres deep in the ground. You would expect that to be quite dense. And when they get into that, I think that's when they really find out how much uh, sterifiber is there. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move on now. Um, You've got a question to Mr. Oh, sorry, Councillor Cooper. Sorry, thought of loud enough we are that chair. Um, plastic and glass and everything in the ecosystem has been very much in the media in the last um, few months. Um, we're talking about the effects in the soil here. What, have we any idea what the impacts of all this are going to be once it gets into the ecosystem with the wildlife? I mean, this is a long-term thing, this, isn't it? You know, it's going to be there for donkey's years. We don't know how much it's going to decompost. The question has been asked about why it goes into the subsoil. Well, trees naturally grow in the subsoil anyway. Um, you get the fibre shoots in the topsoil, but most of it's in the subsoil. And you're going to get a lot of wildlife that's going to get access to this. Well, I think... I think we all saw a programme recently called Drowning in Plastic that was on the uh, BBC and that was dealing mainly with plastic that's got into the oceans but there were a lot of distressing scenes of birds that had swallowed through their life presumably lots of little bits of plastic and they were to help these birds they were actually rescuing them and then making them vomit and it showed what their stomach contents was and it was lots of little bits of plastic just like the ones that are in this sterifiber. Um, and uh, there is a, a code of practice um, that was issued for the use of sludge, compost, and other organic materials for land reclamation. And this was issued uh, by the Scottish and Northern Ireland Forum 
for environmental research. I, I haven't been able to find an English e equivalent of it, but I, I guess they know what they're talking about. And they say that the adverse physical impacts of recycled organic matter include the content of inert material that may be present, such as stones, glass, rubble, plastic, and metal. Controls in standards, such as PAS 100, exist to ensure the quantity of phys physical contaminants present is recycled organic in recycled organic materials is minimized, if not eliminated. The impact of such material is largely visual. Fragments of glass and small fractions of plastic are highly visible at a distance. There is also the potential for harm to animals via the ingestion of glass, metal, and larger fragments of plastic. In the case of certain re recycled organic materials, dust may have a significant physical impact, particularly during application and possibly afterwards, if the material has not been effectively incorporated. So there's like a warning there about don't use material that's contaminated. And I think there was a discussion earlier on that was saying, you know, this is an old material 10 years ago, um, best technology at the time. I don't think it was. I think this was somebody just trying to chance their arm at doing something fairly cheaply. Um, but it certainly um, has much higher levels of contaminants than anything else that's on the market now. And I think this may be part of the reason why put, people are putting it in the subsoil, perhaps, so that it's not immediately on the surface. But as we all know, eventually stuff works its way up through the soil and comes out on the surface. And this glass, in particular, is going to be there forever. I mean, the plastic may eventually uh, disappear, but the glass is certainly going to be there. So I hope that answers your question, Councillor. Um, yes, can we uh, make sure it's kept to succinct questions, please? You know, re when you talk about the plastic in the environment, it, it, this is not going to be a, a picture of um, wildlife gnawing on a plastic milk bottle. This is stuff that's been ground down to a size where wildlife and everything's going to get at it easy. You know, and this is going to be readily digestible, so the problem's going to be even worse because it's going to the ecosystem quicker. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Ballinger. Um, as you know, I asked the previous um, speaker about older, and as I would say, I know around my area, probably about three miles away from here, we have experienced older. Now, you mentioned older. Um, could you tell me uh, a bit more about the older issues where you are, if there is any? Okay. Um, but we had. We had a real odour problem up to and uh, around the time until Sterifiber went bust because they were bringing lorries into site which had steaming uh, Sterifiber on that had just been freshly made and they were taking stuff out as well and the empty lorries weren't covered and they smelt as well. So there was a horrendous problem. The main problem comes when the wind is in a certain direction. If it's in the northwesterly direction, it hits Hampole. If it's in the southerly direction, it hits Scalebrook. And, um, and if it's in a southwesterly direction, it was getting as far as Skello, which is actually on the other side of the A1, so it's traveling more than a mile, and there were some complaints from there. Since 2012, the issue um, went away. The pile crossed it over. Uh, it wasn't being moved. Nobody was digging into it in any big way. And, uh, and that's fine. Um, up until recently, obviously in August, they've started shipping stuff out. Um, and Touchwood, as I mentioned earlier, there haven't been any significant issues. I think one or two people have got smells of it as they've been walking around the locality. But at the moment, we haven't had winds that have been blowing in the direction of either village. So um, it may be that things are better now. I've, been, I've actually stood on the pile with Roy and um, when they were digging into it, it was still steaming. I mean, it's a big compost heap, this, and we all know that compost stays very hot in the middle and it was still steaming and it was still very smelly. So um, the lorries they're using now are much better than they used before. Uh, they're better um, sealed on the top of the covers, so that's a, that's a good thing. 
Um, but I think as they get deeper in the pile and it gets more odorous, I think we may have more problems. I hope not, because we all want to see it go. And that's, that's the other side of this, that you know, people are not likely to complain as much if they think, well, at least you know, we can put up with this for a bit to get rid of it, but uh, you know, please don't let it go on forever. I mean, there were some health issues associated with it, as I mentioned as well. In 2012, we had five people in Hampole that were all suffering uh, respiratory-related uh, issues, some with breathlessness, some with uh, blocked noses, some with itchy eyes, which they associated with the smell of the sterifiber. It was looked at by the uh, Health Protection Agency, um, who basically wrote back and said, uh, well, it's inconclusive because there's not a, a big enough sample. Uh, well, you're not going to get a big sample in a small village. So I hope that, um, that answers your question, Councillor. Uh, can I see um, just, just quickly, um, the, the representative for, for Cat Plant said that um, we, we talk, they talked about possibly using on, on the site some of the stuff on the site because the slopes currently are too steep for agriculture. Why do you know anything about why this, the, the slopes are too steep to return back to agriculture? Because obviously it sort of forms part of the overall idea of how we're going to get rid of this stuff. Um, I think. It's a, it's a little bit of a mystery to us, this, and uh, I mean, we had raised issues about the general landform about three or four years ago, and in particular, it was about the height, because as you can see on those pictures, that I'm afraid aren't, don't show up very well on this, but you can see there's quite a high um, pile appearing there. This is the, obviously the, this is the landfill, it's not the steri fiber pile, um, but it's getting to heights that are... Um, well, at that time, we were told there was no need to worry. I think Doncaster Council was involved, Roy was there as well, and did a survey, and we were assured that actually it was going to get back to that which had been permitted. Um, but the recent plans that we've seen on this, and that's what alerted us to it, is that the height um, is in excess of 70 metres now, but, and, to, and this is just at the southern end. Now, the southern end is permitted to be some, a gentle slope up to 50 to 55 metres, uh, starting at 50, going up to 55, and then as the site goes further north, going uh, up to greater heights, ultimately ending up at around 61 metres, very much in line with what it was uh, before they quarried and landfilled it. But they're already at the southern uh, end of it, up to 70 metres, and even if you allow for the most optimistic uh, amount of settlement, that would still mean you would be about 64 or 65 metres, that allowing for 20% settlement. Uh, obviously, the landfill that you take from the bottom of the quarry to the top of the quarry, so it's like 30 metres of landfill, which would compress by about 20%. Um, and consequently, if you've got a much greater height and you're trying to squeeze as much landfill in as you can, I think the... the uh, slopes have now become extremely steep and I think I mentioned that we're looking at stuff that is typically one in four now whereas the gentle slopes that were permitted were something like one in 30 um, and it's very clear when you compare the two uh, contour maps of what, what was conditioned and what we have now at the southern end. So uh, the real worry is we're at the southern end where it's supposed to be 50 to 55. What's it going to be when they get to the highest point, which is about uh, in the middle of the site, um, which is still some way to go in terms of landfilling and restoration, um, and what's it going to look like? Because this is in, and I think, again, uh, Roy has written this, and it was in talking about biomass, but saying that it's actually the site is in a very um, prominent position and very visible because it's the, at the edge of the limestone ridge and therefore it's critical how it looks. I mean, he was arguing f for the public inquiry that it would actually be wrong to be growing biomass there because it wouldn't be fitting in with the other fields around it. So I, I think a mountain or a hill that is significantly higher than anything else around it um, would... Um, do some significant damage to this landscape. And don't forget, the other side of the A638, which it sits on, the other side of the A638, is an area of special landscape value. 
So I think that, that, I mean, obviously that in itself is going to perhaps be some fight for another day um, because the, the whole uh, contours and landform seems to be totally running out of control, in my view. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we'll have to move on. Um, so um, we'll go on to questions to officers, please, or to, to the officer. In... Sorry, did you... Yes. Yes. Yeah, I haven't reached you. <laughs> you go first. I still think it's it's relevant, and I'm not quite. I think Roy may very well have a view on it. But we go back to um, the slopes on the on the open site there, which are now quite steep. And one that I can't get fixed into my mind. Um, it's a, a minor point I, I realise is that all of this stereo fibre was meant to enhance the soil. Now we're talking about that it cannot be used for agriculture, um, uh, and the, the steepness is, is much steeper than it was in the original planning application. I suspect. Therefore, the, my follow-on question is: is were the uh, the steepness were they um, approved as part of the original planning application? Just to uh, remind committee that the use of sterifiber on this site does not form any part of the application consideration before you today. This is to do with the retention of the sterifiber pad and the stockpile for a temporary period of six years as per, but then with recommendations of conditions coming forward to restrict that. That's for the, 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 the committee. With regards to the slopes and the steepness, yep, that was uh, governed by the original permission for the quarry. The 2001 application was granted in 2004, and indeed the author of the application is sat at the back. Uh, Mr. Mr. Ballam uh, was the, uh, the, the applicant at the time for, for doing that. Uh, but yet that is something to do with uh, the 2004 permission, nothing to do with the application before you. Chair, I've got an alternative recommendation if nobody else has got any, uh, any, any questions for the officer. Sure. <laughs> Would you like me to put it forward before we try to get a seconder, Chair? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm just trying to move progress, really, and I, you know, I, haven't, I, I wasn't party to any of the 2015, so this will be the first time, actually, that I've, I've proposed anything. Uh, as long as it's lasted for 10 years, but I do believe that we should actually refuse this today on the basis that it's inappropriate development in the green belt. Roy, the officer, quite clearly, and this isn't part of the recommendation, but Roy, the officer, clearly successfully defended uh, or helped us to defend a, um, you know, a previous application that went to appeal and we won. So I, I, I think hopefully he would stand by that. Even his submission to the public inquiry that was going to take place made it very clear. And I, and I can quote some of his testimony, it wasn't testimony, some of the, some of the statements that he was going to make if he's, if he's mindful to forget some of that. However, I do think that it's inappropriate development in the Green Belt uh, and it does not preserve the openness uh, demonstrably. There are no special circumstances. And this is the material plan, in fact. There are no very special circumstances to justify it here. We've heard a little bit today about sustainable use, visual impact, waste hierarchy and all the rest of it. I don't believe spreading plastic as part of that actually is part of government policy as much as we've been trying to be taught today that it is. It is not, let's be clear. And so therefore also it does not safeguard the countryside from encroachment because we've seen if we allowed an application today we'd likely have to have one in a few years time. And this is in line, all of this is in line with the NPPF and Doncaster's policies, CS3, core strategy ENV3, and the UDP, those parts that we've saved of it. So I think there's loads to go at here, to be fair. I think we could easily defend an appeal, and therefore I'm going to propose, given if anybody's mindful to second that, that we refuse this application today. Firstly, uh, I'm informed that we have to put the proposal to you. If that falls, then we can accept your... Um, your. No, Chair, I thought we were allowed to make an alternative yeah. suggestion. Do you want to say? Not unless it negates the original motion. I think the, the, if I'm right, right to what I'm saying, that 
sorry, I'm speaking. Remember what I'm saying, obviously, that the proposal is to grant the I remember in the past that we put forward an alternative motion and if there was the, the substantive was considered to have fallen. Okay, all right, no problem. Okay, no, no, we'll do that. So so in other words what you're saying is if we all vote against the existing or nobody votes for it, we can then vote for the alternative. Okay, are members happy with that? Okay. So in that case, I will put the motion to you which is to grant subject to conditions. Now do I have a mover and a seconder for that? No. In that case, it falls. So now I can put to you... Could we default to my original position, yes, which I therefore... Unless others would like to propose it, I don't know if I people are happy seconder, for me. I need a seconder. You've proposed it. Could I, I have a seconder, seconder please? Sure. Right. Now then, um, we can put that to you. Do you... Um, everyone in favour of the proposal from Councillor Wood? In favour? That's unanimous. Right. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes, Councillor Healy. Um, we must move on now to our application number four. And it is... Um, I'm going to let some people leave the room first. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right, carry on to application number four. It is 1801338. Um, it's reserved matters for land off Doncaster Road, Hatfield, and the presenting officer is Mark Saul. Uh, I do have a speaker on this. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you say, the uh, application is reserved matters application, direction of 211 dwellings off Doncaster Road at Hatfield. 
uh, and details of the appearance, landscaping, layout and scale are being considered. Uh, means of access have already been agreed under the original outline planning application. The application has been presented to members because of uh, local interest. We've had 16 representations, objections to the proposal. A couple of pre-committee amendments. Okay, so we've got two requests to speak, and I believe Chair has been confirmed that uh, one, one um, uh, Katrina O'Halloran is not able to, to make it to the meeting now, um, so we've just got a, a speaker in support. Um, just as a couple of issues outstanding in the report, you might have noticed if you've gone through. Um, generally, we've, during the course of the application, we've asked for a few amendments, mainly on design and landscaping and highways grounds. Um, so we've had some amended plans in um, after the report was finished. Uh, in terms of the landscaping, we were looking for more on-plot and um, street-side um, landscaping and planting. The applicants have provided updated plans, um, so we've got somewhere just shy of 90 um, trees and, um, across the site, in addition to what was previously pro um, proposed. And the relevant officers have looked at those plans and they raise no objections to the landscaping as it stands now. Similarly, there's a few fairly minor highways technical um, issues that have been raised in terms of turning areas and um, path treatments, that kind of thing. And the applicants have addressed those uh, issues to the, uh, to the satisfaction of the highways officer. So I'll just go through the, um, through the slides. You can see the... Uh, Aerial photo of the site, so you've got Doncaster Road, triangular site, Doncaster Road along the western side, uh, Lings Lane along the east, and this is the proposed site plan. So it's around half the site, the outline permission uh, continued, the red line continued further to the south and, and that was up to around 400 dwellings, we're looking at the northern section um, of around uh, 211 dwellings. As you can see from the site layout, the uh, mature trees and hedgerows along the road frontage to uh, Doncaster Road have been retained as part of the site, quite a wide buffer. The landscaping is quite, quite thick along there. Uh, a equipped um, area of open plays proposed right at the northern section there, closest to the uh, existing residential properties. And then to the east, a slight change from the indicative layout, which I'll come to in a minute, which, which we sh showed you as part of the outline permission. Um, they are proposing a shallow attenuation basin along the eastern side of the site, um, which could double, uh, double up as kind of informal open space during, during, during the dry months. That was the indicative layout that we saw originally, which shows the full site. As you can see, the attenuation basin was previously shown to the northern edge. Uh, what this new uh, layout achieves is to bring some of the housing away from uh, Lings Lane and from the listed windmill, so it provides a bit better buffer along the eastern side there. The small triangular grassed area, which you can see just on the eastern side of Lings Lane, was the subject of a planning application which came to you a few months ago, I think, for nine dwellings. Uh, this application proposes a, um, a footpath link through to that as well, so uh, when those properties are developed out, there will be permeability through, through the sites into the public open space and the facilities further to the, uh, in, within the village. Um, the majority of the objections that were received from, from local residents were concerned with issues that a principle really that we looked at at the outline consent, so it was the impact on the local road network. Um, a transport assessment was provided with the outline planning application and deemed to be acceptable by highways and transportation. Um, impact on local services, now the 106, I've got the figures in here somewhere, did provide for an education contribution as well, so, so that would be forthcoming as part of the proposal. And the proposal does deliver a level of affordable housing, but as I say, those issues were discussed as part of the outline. So it's really just looking at the design and layout uh, of, of the proposal before you. So to come to that, I'll show you some typical street scenes. It's a mixture of two and two and a half storey dwelling semi and detached properties, mainly family dwellings. Uh, no objections to the design overall or the amount of amenity space, separation distances, they all meet our normal standards. You may be familiar with the site. I think the site's been at committee a couple of times before, but some, um, some 
Votoshen site from Doncaster Road looking to the east. Again, Doncaster Road to the east. There's a water tower further to the south. There's existing housing across the road. As I say, the trees and things that you can see on the left hand side of the picture there are all, all to be retained along that frontage. And that's the site looking west from Ling's Lane. So, no objections overall. Um, as I say, I've put a couple of additional conditions and changes to the conditions that are in the report. Uh, amendment to condition one, just setting out the exact approved plans there, including the landscaping plans that have come in, um, and just uh, an additional condition around uh, ensuring that the scheme of landscaping is implemented. Um, so, it's accordingly recommended for approval. Thank you, Mark. Um, the first speaker, um, is Michael Hepburn and he wishes to speak. Mr Hepburn, take a seat at the front and um, press the big green, big red button and you have up to five minutes. Um, if you want to share it between you or one or other, yeah, you can. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Hepburn. I'm from Litchfield and I'm a planning consultant working on behalf of Linden Homes, who will be building the houses at this site. I intend to keep this, this brief, as the officers' update and report have been very comprehensive. I'm more than happy to any, answer any questions that you have, and Andy Kramer here from Linden Homes is also able to answer, answer any questions. This application seeks approval of matters that were reserved when outline planning permission was granted by this committee in November 2016. The application relates to the first of two phases that will make up this development and seeks approval of four reserved matters, layout, scale, appearance and landscaping. The outline planning permission established a master plan and a form of development which this application has fully adhered to. Following the approval of the outline application, Lyndon and their team have worked closely with council officers from various departments to ensure that the principles on which the outline permission was granted have been carried through to the detailed layout for the development. Revisions were made to the plan through this process to incorporate comments and suggestions from officers. I'll now run through some of the key aspects of each reserve matter. So in terms of scale, there's 211 homes proposed in this phase, 53% of the total of 400 for the wider site. All of the houses will be two or two and a half storeys in height. In terms of layout, during the detailed technical analysis of the site, it was found that the drainage attenuation basin uh, should be moved from the northern edge to the eastern edge of the site. Other than this, the layout closely follows the principles established in the approved outline master plan. The northern, eastern and western edges face outwards to take advantage of, of the rural views. The Council's highways officers have confirmed that they are satisfied with the layout of the road network and its specification. Development has been set back from the historic windmill on the Lings and a large public open space in the northwestern corner of the site is accessible to existing as well as all of the new residents. An informal route around the site links the open spaces and the small housing site to the east on the Lings. With regard to appearance, all of the houses will be detached or semi-detached with a traditional appearance. Red brick and dark tiles that are common in the Hatfield area will be used. The homes occupy generous plots with appropriate separation distances. Parking is accommodated within each plot with garages and driveways as well as widened roads to provide spaces for visitors. On landscaping, the mature trees and hedgerow along Doncaster Road will be protected with the houses set back behind it to create a green frontage for the whole site. The hedgerow that runs through the site will also be protected. A drainage attenuation basin is created on the eastern edge of the site and a children's play area is to be provided on the northern edge. All of the open spaces within the site will be carefully landscaped to create new habitats for wildlife. The road leading off Doncaster Road into the site will also be lined with trees to create an attractive and impressive entrance to the development. Plant and tree species that are native to the UK will be used throughout. I'm pleased to say that there are no outstanding objections from any of the Council's departments that were consulted on the application. Whilst there have been objections from some members of the public, we note that many of the issues raised were addressed at the outline application stage, such as the loss of agricultural land, the impact upon local services and the highway network, and flood risk. On each point, the proposals were deemed to be satisfactory. Turning to the other points that have been raised, the development will have a very positive impact on local shops and services as a result of the spending from the new residents. Over £500,000 will be paid towards the Dunsfield and Lakeside primary schools as the new houses are completed. 
I've explained how trees and hedgerows will be retained and new wildlife habitats will be created. And lastly, archaeological works are required as a condition on the planning permission and these will be undertaken prior to starting construction. Subject to the outcome of today's meeting, Linden Homes are committed to starting construction as quickly as possible and we ask that you approve this application for what will be a high quality addition to Hatfield. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, questions to the uh, Councillor Shaw, then Councillor Anderson. I'm sorry if I've, if I've missed it in the, the notes. Um, what percentage of affordability is there going to be? Thank you, uh, can I ask about the provision of parking spaces in their layout design? Your original travel plan within the transport assessment <coughs> for uh, mitigating the impact on the road network by providing the households with bus timetables and encouraging them to use uh, bicycles and walking. Is that reflected by a reduction in car parking spaces? We, we've provided the, the parking required by the officers um, within, within the site. Um, each plot has its uh, parking requirement. Um, and then we will be implementing those measures that, that you described through the travel plan. That, that's being carried over from the outline permission into the uh, construction of the properties. Councillor Wood. You talked about affordable housing being at 10% of the site. How easy was that to, um, to negotiate with the council? Okay, yeah, I do. Um, it, j j just talk us through how you managed to negotiate that from 26% down to 10%. What were the... What were the... Same question. Okay, why, why doesn't this stack up with a greater percentage of affordable housing? It's still not a matter under consideration, Councillor Wood. Um, Chair, the rules of this authority state that 26% should be delivered as affordable housing. We've got a developer in front of us which sits there and tells us we've got 10%. I'm sorry, you know, the rules of this council suggest that it should be 26%. I have a right to know why it's got down to 10%. It was dealt with at the outline planning application. This is, this is merely for the um, design and layout of the site. That, um, that matter was dealt with before. Um, just back to the parking, uh, my colleague asked you about parking and you didn't actually say how many places there were per house, household. No, there's, uh, I think I'm right in saying there's two, two spaces per household. Mm. Um, there's, some of the properties have garages and driveways and then there's visitors par parking spaces available um, because the, some of the roads have been widened to enable visitor parking on those roads. And how many visitor parking spaces are there? It, it, it hasn't been specified exactly because of the widened roads. There are opportunities to park uh, along the roads, but I don't think there's a specific number that was mm, no. set. Sorry, Andy Kramer from Linden Homes. Um, yeah, parts of the road network has been widened for on-street parking, and some of the, uh, the other cul-de-sacs have got allocated visitor parking as well in addition to that uh, yeah. which has all been provided in accordance with the highway right. requirements right. Sorry. Yeah. I understand the principle that some has been provided but I'd like to know specifically what what number because it, it has an impact doesn't it on the on the on the development in the sense of how it flows how blocked up it gets we've got a development just literally outside this building where we've got major issues where not sufficient parking was provided and not sufficient street parking was provided so specifically i will go back to the officer if you can't provide the, the figure well, yeah. the, the approach that we've taken with the widening of the roads was done at the request of the highways officer um, to ensure that they were satisfied now they, they've come back to confirm that that's the case yeah, all right we'll leave it at that um now then is there any further questions? No. Thank you. Thank you very much for your input. Uh, now, we did have another speaker uh, who has had to leave, unfortunately. She has left um, a submission 
Um, but it covers, as has been um, said by the officer presenting, that it only covers items that were decided at the outline um, that are listed here. Um, so, you know, it, it's not... It, 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 it's all the items that were decided as outline. Her comments are about the archaeological interest and all that sort of thing. It's, there are nothing, nothing mentioned at all about the layout, design, etc. of the site. Uh, sorry, I, just, I mean, technically, I don't disagree with you, but if she sat before us, she would be able to say what she wants. It's not for a, it's not for a, a, a member of the public to decide you know, what's relevant or not. They can come and speak, and then we decide what they've got, to, whether it's relevant or not. And I, 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 you know, so it may not be relevant, but she's, I, I, I think in a, from a point of view of democracy and people having but to say... If you feel strongly about it, we'll read it out, but quite frankly, it's completely irrelevant. But if, if, if you feel I strongly it's about it... It's just protocol. Here you are. Submission by Katrina O'Halloran. Sorry, I've had to leave because my parking has expired. On my behalf, would somebody please read this out? I am in opposition to building 211 houses on land off Doncaster Road, Hatfield, even if the plans have been changed, improved or tweaked in any way. Even if they gold-plated the houses, put diamond studs in them and put cherries on the roofs, it would still be inappropriate because there are no places at the local Dunsville, Dunsville Primary School. I rang them this morning. The GP surgeries are not taking on any new patients. I rang them earlier. There is nothing they can do to make this proposed housing development wanted by local residents. Thank you. So we'll move on from that. Uh, any questions to the officer, please? Councillor Cooper, and then Councillor Shaw, and Councillor Wood. Okay. I may get caught in the same ragnet as uh, Councillor Wood here, Chair, insofar as this might relate to the actual original application. Um, but you have mentioned landscaping in this, Mark, but there's no mention <coughs> of landscaping standards in the conditions at the end. We have got amended landscaping details that were submitted showing the location of trees, species, and that is included within the approved plans condition. Uh, that's been looked at by the relevant officers and, and they were happy with it. But are the appropriate standards which that has to be supplied, Mark, included in the original conditions? That's what I'm asking now. And also, you, it mentions again the buffer, the tree buffer, where is the tree protection related condition? I need to make sure that the retained trees are protected to be S5837, it's the almanac, to make sure this is fenced off. And I keep lecturing developers, nothing goes on site until that protective fence is on without, not in the rubber feet, but with the scaffolding poles. So it cannot be moved. And the same is to the British standard for the tree planting. And if, they refer, if you refer to page 77 again, Mark, on another application, those two conditions are referred to before. They seem to be all singing or dancing and they catch just about everything. I think it's time that officers got their heads together and came up with the standard things to just put on instead of different ones on each one. There should be a catch-all that is applied. Yeah, on the outline permission, condition eight, there is a uh, condition relating to tree protection in terms of the... BS 5837, Trees and Construction, so that's on there. There's also uh, Condition 9, relates to details on the land, uh, landscaping planting scheme and that materials should comply with local planning authorities' landscape specifications in relation to development sites, which brings forward those standards that you're talking about. Probably isn't appropriate in every situation, Councillor. There has to be specific reasons. On the first application, it dealt with encroachment into the green belt, and you can imagine why there would be specific reasons to ensure the planting was maintained beyond and above the normal five years. But I would urge committee members to be, you know, more cautious about when it's required and to give reasons why and so forth. Uh, we, we probably can't ask for that carte blanche. But it is something we will explore moving forwards, uh, knowing what your desires are, Councillor. 
Well, you know, it's not very often you and me fall out, right, but we might on this one, mate. Um, I think that 15 years is appropriate on every application. Trees are long term, they're not there for 5 or 15 years, they're there for as long as, they pre they're, as they're prepared to grow. Um, and then the, the TPO thing is the catch-all that when that tree dies or is taken out, another one goes in. Right, I've got um, Councillor Shaw and Councillor Wood. Councillor Shaw? Yeah, I, I, just quickly, I don't think... Uh, I, yeah, I think that Councillor yeah, Cooper it. wanted to pursue that and wanted an answer, yes or no, before I, I asked my... Well, it's outside of the chamber, Chair. OK, yes. fine, fine, OK. So, uh, for the officer, two things. Um, the lady you left the note... It alluded to the fact that the development doesn't look sustainable in the sense of education and doctor surgeries. What, you know, what information have you got regarding that? On the education, again, it was covered by the outline. The council's education team were consulted. They came up with an, an, an ask, financial ask, to provide additional spaces in the locality, and that was written into the 106 for the site. So uh, that was education taken care of. Didn't get a response from the um, from from in, in terms of the health service. So, when was the outline uh, granted? It came before planning committee in 2016. That's two years ago. Two years ago. In terms of parking, <laughs> you knew I'd get there in the end. Uh, <laughs> what, what's the situation? I mean, is it just to, just to take it that there is going to be some extra parking and it'll all be fine? What, what, I, I, so there's 400 dwellings. How many parking spaces in total are there going to be on this site, including obviously if somebody's got a garage? Well, there's 211 on this part of the site. Uh, I was just scrabbling around for an exact number and I'm not being able to find it here. But as, as the applicants have stated, there's at least two spaces per dwelling. So that's at least 400. There are unmarked visitor parking opportunities across the site because they've widened. Well, the highways officer is happy with that layout because the layout in I'm terms of the... Or I, 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 that's fine. Yeah. I'm happy or I'm not happy with it. I don't understand why I can't have a number. It, it, you know, it's relevant. I can, I can get you a number, but I've not got it to hand at the moment. But suffice to say, the highways officers assessed it. He assessed the visitor parking. We went back a couple of times to the applicants on the issue of visitor parking. Uh, and, and they've come up with a layout which is acceptable to the highways officer in terms of the numbers. I've not got one in front of me at the moment, though. It, it, I don't know, Mark, you, you help me out here, but it may be that there is no definitive number for parking on the highway because it is just a widened carriageway that isn't uh, demarcated with uh, visitor parking. It's just the opportunity is there. If you've got, a, you know, if a car, if an average car is three metres long and you've got a road that's X metres long and you go, oh, roughly we can fit that many cars in there. Uh, that's all I'm trying to ascertain. Is it, you know, it could be one. You know, you could say, well, actually, there's two, and we, we, we try and get 2.5 per household word, you know, whatever it is. You know, there might be, there might be more spaces than there's ever going to be used. But it's not beyond, the, you know, the wit of man, surely, to be able to say, well, we've got X meterage of, of road there that we're providing, and on average, a car's this wide. So on average, we can, you know, 200 visitors can come on site. If you turn around and go, well, actually, everybody's happy with it, but it's only 10 visitors coming to site. I mean, this is an application before us. I, I just need to get some sort of idea. You know, when, when we look at the outline planning and we've given away, you know, 10% affordability, are we, what else are we just rolling over on? We're not rolling over on anything. The, the, the supplementary planning guidance for, for, uh, resident, for the residential design guide sets what uh, visitor parking ratio should be, and it's normally around two and a half spaces per unit. We've met the standards that are in there. But I don't know what the exact number is, but they have been met. It's not, it's not deficient in visitor parking. Um, I would submit, to Councillor Shaw, that it would be damn impossible to say how many on-street parkings, put to, to quote a case out here, the road that is now closed, there is supposed to be, or was supposed to be, six visitor, six disabled parking spaces. Day after day after day, there is five cars there because people do not park tidily. One is out of shape and then it, it, the whole thing. So to actually say you can fit so many up the road. Well, we, have a, 
we have a technical specification that we are trying to achieve, which is 2.5 vehicles. That's a number. It's, a, it's setting, you know, it is a number that we're trying to adhere to. And you're saying that we've reached that, but you can't, t it's, you can't tell me how we've reached it. So that, that's, you know, so on that basis, if every dwelling's got two places to park and there's 400 dwellings, you know, then, you know, how, how, many, how many visitor parking spaces do we need and have we got that amount? It's just a, it's just a calculation, isn't it? I can't, it, it's basic. I don't know whether this is an issue or not, and it's not something we are going to be able to answer today on this one. Take it as read that should uh, widened carriageways come forward again at future planning committees that can accommodate off-street off parking, on-street parking, we will ensure that we build that number into the committee reports and so forth for your information. That will, information will be there, it's just at this moment in time the officer doesn't have that information before him. All we can say is that the highways officer is happy with the level of parking that's been proposed, but we will take that moving forwards. Thank you, Roy. Uh, Councillor Wood. Thank you, Chair. Hoping you won't slap me down again. I appreciate this is a reserve matters. However, as we talk more and more about parking, and we've got at least two spaces in front of these beautiful new houses, but, but Mark, I'm just, you know, I appreciate this is reserve matters, but, you know, looking at what you now know with regard to reserve matters and the 10% affordable housing, you know, if we're building houses that are nice houses with two cars on the drive, you know, do we really continue to believe developers that say that the numbers don't stuck, stack up for a little bit more? Because I suspect these will be very, not reasonably as in cheap, but they will be reasonably as in market-priced houses. And I think when that's the case, and it's obvious that, that, that you know, householders are going to have at least two cars on a, on a drive with a garage mm -hmm. and all the rest of it, that, that you know... Mindfully, you might look back and think, you know, 10% was a little bit low. And, you know, genuine question. Do you think now 10% was a little bit low, knowing all that you know with regard to reserve matters? All I'll say is that it went before the planning committee. The applicant provided a viability assessment that was independently assessed, agreed and presented to planning committee. That's all I can say about it. I appreciate you saying that, Mark, but, but, you know, as a supplementary question, I hate to say it, we say we don't believe these things when we're looking at the initial proposals. I, I can say with absolute certainty, without even to look at the tape, that we will have disagreed with these viability statements. And once again, I hate to say it, looking at here, I feel verified, that vilified, that we have been proved right again. And I'd encourage you to go back in future and hold people's feet to the fire. Because I don't think we get enough out of these applications for the people that live in the neighbourhoods, the people that are going to, you know, visit health centres, schools and all the rest of it. I just think we could just do better. It's not your fault personally, but I think you ought to take it back to your colleagues and say the planning committee expects a little bit better. Yeah, 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 yeah Mark. Uh, can I just about open space? Um, obviously, the, the, this is uh, for... Uh, uh, open space at either side of this development. Why is, why is that? Because surely it should be within the development, uh, open space, and who is actually going to look after this open space? And as uh, the, the, uh, the local area benefited from, from, from this open space, be any, any money or anything like that? 106 agreement. The open space is... In, in terms of open space and 106 agreement, it's normally... If it can't be delivered on site, which is always our preference, if the site's too small or there's other technical reasons it can't be delivered on site, uh, then we would have a commuted sum in lieu of that. In this case, the site can accommodate it. Uh, it's located up to the northern edge of the site, uh, the equipped area. Um, simply, well, it's, it's a good location. It's close to the existing properties as well as the proposed property, so it's easily accessible. There's a footpath link around the site as well, so um, properties uh, to the eastern side can, can access it. Um, then the other more informal area is, is, is doubled up with the attenuation shallow basin, which, which, which is dry virtually all year round. So that, that's more of an informal area of open space. Again, that's linked up with the footpaths surrounding the site as well. 
in terms of how it will be managed, uh, normally what happens on these sites is a condition around on the outline um, how this will work, but normally how it works is that there will be a um, residents will pay into a pot quarterly or yearly or whatever it is, and a management company will look after the open space on the sites. Just want to ask about the informal open space. Is does that make up a part of their requirement to provide open space? Is it un informal in the sense that it's extra, or in informal in the sense that it's not a structured area? It's informal. In well, open space provides a lot of different roles. There's the equipped area, so that's formal play, which there is a need for, and, and we've asked for in the development of this size. Informal is, is just that it's walking up to dog walking opportunities, that kind of thing. In terms of the offer on this site, as I think as you can see from the amount of green open space on the site, it's well above what we, we would normally ask for around 10% on site, and, and it well exceeds that. So it's a combination of the two, certainly in terms of strict policy requirements and the green space audits for the area, the uh, equipped area of play is, is, is what's required for a scheme of this size, and then. As I say, they've, they've been able to provide more informal as well. Um, if I could just um, back up what Mark said there, Chair, um, for Councillor Yules, for my colleague there. Um, it is tradition now to put the play, the play areas on the outskirts of the village because after the war they put them in the middle of new estates and you've got complaints on all sides. So the trend now is to put them to the outside so you've only got one row of houses generally adjacent to it and it reduces the complaints. Um, all that, what I would ask is the play equipment is generally, it used to be leap and neap, local equipped area for play and neighbourhood equipped area for play. One up to five items of equipment and I think the other used to have up to eight. So I don't know what designation this is. Chair. Sorry, yes, Chair, if I, if I may just come back on um, play equipment, certainly from my perspective, I've seen, you know, th 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 there seemed to be a trend and maybe it's gone away and behind the times, but we had play equipment installed throughout the borough where, you know, it was very easy to make noise with it and we had a, we had a point where people were integrating playscapes with stones in them and all the rest of it and, and you know, we started to get a, a, a lot of complaints from noise because you know kids were throwing stones into the um, slides and all the rest of it. Has anything moved further forward on that to the extent that we are really thinking about smart design? Because as much as kids like noises because they can make it on play equipment and obviously you, you know you've, you've got a space here that's, that's going to be used for that. It, it, have we started to address that in terms of making sure that we've got sensible design for this stuff and we don't put things like pebbles down and, and, and things like that. Hopefully we've moved on. I just know that we, we, have, got, we have had problems with that quite substantially in different wards. I haven't got the detailed designs here again as a condition on the outline for not only the management of the open space but, but what form it takes basically. But there's enough space there. In terms of detailed design, I'm not sure. I think like I say it's something that's constantly evolving. There's kind of trends and fashions, isn't there? You see kind of old play, play areas look totally different to how they do now. And I think from the developer's point of view, they're not going to want to develop something out. There is properties facing onto here, so they're not going to want to design something that's going to have some kind of antisocial potential for, for residents who are going to be buying properties around there. But we would be looking at those, and we've got open space officers as well who will be looking at the designs. We will be looking at that as part of... We will be looking at that as part of discharging conditions, but if you could just, just make special attention to that, because we have made some mistakes in the past, and... You know, it, it, let's not have tinny equipment on stones that people can, you know, bang about. And right, thank you. Um, I'll put then the recommendation to you that uh, we grant this um, application. Do I have a mover for that? Councillor Durant, I will second that. And I'll put that to you, all in favour? Eight, nine. One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 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 And uh, any against? Two, Two against. Two. 
That's it. Leaves no abstentions. Thank you. Now, um, I have to put it to you, committee, and that's why I wasn't paying attention. Is that? At, um, I was paying attention for you. Thank you. Okay. At five oh eight, we have to. Um, we will we'll have had, come to the three hours. Now we have another application, um, but this room is also booked for five thirty. Um, <laughs> which? Anything important, chair? I mean, really, we need to have a, a, have a break now because um, we're not going to get through in 10 minutes or 15 minutes um, because there's uh, speakers and, you know, it obviously takes longer. Um, so, I mean, what... Uh, I think we should keep going. <laughs> do, you, do you want to just keep going now so and hopefully we can get through this? <laughs> so, I'll... Yeah, well... Um, I'll have to move, I'll move on quickly. <laughs> Do you want to? To the application five, it's 1801628. It's a full application for five Conway Drive, Branton, and the presenting officer is Alicia Murray. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Chair. Um, as the report outlines, this application is for alterations and extensions to number five Conway Drive in Branton. Uh, these alterations and extensions include raising the roof height to create rooms in the roof space a rear extension to replace the conservatory, a front extension to the existing gable to create a porch area, a rear roof and insertion of roof lights to the front and rear. In total, the application has received 24 representations, um, 13 of which are in support and 17 of which are in objection. The Parish Council and Councillor Cox uh, originally raised concerns over the submission um, and since the amended scheme have, not, uh, have made the choice not to make any further comments on it. Um, the amended plans were received during the application process. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, the application site is located in a cul-de-sac. Um, it's a bit faint, unfortunately, because of the screens, but it's just there. As you can see, the mouse flying over it. Um, <clears throat> it's in a cul-de-sac. Uh, the site itself is a rear and front grass area with a double car length driveway leading to the garage. Uh, from an area in which you can see that number seven Conway Drive has a conservatory on its side elevation and I would also like to point out that the tree which you can see to the rear boundary or within the grounds of number 14 the close which is directly to the rear of the site has been removed since the aerial has been taken. It, it's very bad because of the screens. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I'm like, it's like that. <laughs> um, it was in, it was diseased. Okay. Uh, the site plan shows the um, the extent of the proposed extensions. Um, as you can see, there's an extension coming off the side elevation and off the rear. Um, I will note that the front extension is a new extension, but the rear extension is to replace an existing one. Um, and the position of the roof lights, which there would be three at the, towards the rear roof slope and one at the front roof slope. Um, from this plan, you can see that the relationship between the site and the neighbouring properties, the property is over 21 metres away from properties on the close and the houses opposite Conway Drive. Uh, this shows the existing situ at the site. The dwelling has a gable projection to the front and a gable style roof, which is positioned horizontally in the site. Additionally, there is a protecting gable to the rear leading to a hip roof conservatory. Uh, the house is currently four bedrooms and the proposal would not result in an increase in bedrooms. Um, so I'll take some through some photos before we look at the proposed plans so you can get a context of it. Um, so uh, this is the front elevation of the site showing the driveway and, and the front cladded projection and the relationship with number three Conway Drive. Uh, this photo shows the site in relationship to number seven Conway Drive. Um, this photo shows the relationship with number seven Conway Drive from the rear from the rear garden. Um, as you can see, you can just see the gable protection of number seven. <coughs> so, there we go. 
Um, it was thought that the, from this visit that um, that we needed to remove the dormer windows from the rear elevation. As you see, this photo was taken from inside number 14, the, co the closest rear garden. Um, and because it's a bungalow at the minute, it does meet the distances, but the inclusion of dormers would probably would have created a feeling of overlooking for the resident at number 14. Um, but it does meet all the separation distances of over 21 metres. And then these photos just are within the rear of the site. This just shows a relationship with other properties on the coast because they have also objected. Um, and then this one is taken from the garden of number seven. Number seven Conway Drive was the main objector on this application. Um, as you can see, the proposal would result in a loss of the two gables and a hipped conservatory. Um, and the addition, the addition of an extended projection at the highest point of 0.4 metres higher than the existing plus a flat roof single storey extension. Uh, this is actually taken, it's quite a difficult photo, it looks like I'm showing you nothing, but actually it's taken directly from the outside elevation of the, the number seven Conway Drive's conservatory. So that's the distance from the conservatory to number seven, to number five Conway Drive. Uh, and then finally, this just shows the other properties on Conway Drive, just see that they are either horizontally faced within the site in terms of the gables, or they're vertically gabled into the site. So each one varies really from being lengthways and longways within the site itself. Okay, so this was the scheme as originally submitted. Um, uh, after visiting the site, it was clear that the amendments were required uh, to reduce the submission for its impact on street sheen and the dominance to the surrounding neighbours. As you can see, the original submission was for a 1.5 metre increase in roof light to a duchy style roof with dormer windows to the front and back. Um, since then, the submission negotiations between the applicant agent and the case of us took place and the amended plans have been submitted, which I'll show you in now, which is these are the amended plans. So the increase in roof height is now 0.4 metres um, from the street scene. The dwelling would appear similar to the existing situation. Uh, to achieve the head height, the roof apex will be extended further across the, towards the rear and then slope down to almost create a hipped appearance, uh, leading down to a single storey flat roof extension, projecting 3.8 metres off the rear elevation, which is the same projection as what the conservatory has now. Uh, the front extension would create a much wider and therefore steeper front projection, but this is not considered to be detrimental to the street scene. So I'll just point out, because uh, that's what it would look like from number seven Conway Drive. So right now they have a, a gable that comes out and extends down, whereas now it would be a hipped sort of style, just because of the extension of the projection. Uh, this is the floor plan to show that um, the bedrooms three and four would move upstairs, freeing up the ground floor space for a larger kitchen and dining room area. And then this just shows the sections. So the section shows that the roof lights would be 1.1 metres off the floor level and reach a further 0.7 metres up to the roof slope. This is to meet building regulations in terms of means of escape. Given the roof pitch and the separation distances between the properties, these roof lights would not create overlooking to the residents of the close. This has resulted in number 14, the close, removing their objections. Um, number 7, Conway Drive, has maintained their objection on grounds of character, overshadowing, overdominance and loss of privacy. Number 3, Conway Drive, is in support of the scheme. And number 12, Conway, Con uh, number 12 the close, sorry, have maintained their objection also on the precedent that this could set for other houses in the area. However, it is considered that this amended scheme is a sufficient compromise for all parties involved and would not have a significantly detrimental impact to the street scene character of the area or to the occupiers of the neighbouring dwellings. Additionally, the render is thought not to be detrimental to the character of the area and the application is, um, is recommended for grant on that basis. Um, just to finish off the pre-committee amendments, um, which I'll take through now, there's been one additional representation received, which I've already touched upon from number 12, the Klaus, uh, maintaining their objections. The Parish Council have commented to say there is no further comments to make on the application. And for clarification, as it has been missed off the agenda pack, this application is recommended as a grant subject to condition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I do have one speaker on this, and that is Mr. Andrew Shepherd, who is the applicant. Mr. Shepherd? Oh, I see. Um, no, it, it'll be fine, thank you. Um, in that case, we will move to questions of the officer. 
Any questions? No. Uh, in that case, I will put it to you. The recommendation is to grant this application. Uh, do I have that mo a mover, Councillor Durant? Do I have a seconder, Councillor McGuinness? I'll put that to you. All in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you very much. <laughs> agenda item six, which is actually for, agenda item six, is for your noting. It is uh, just the conclusions of three um, decisions from the um, inspectorate, uh, all of which I have to glad to note that we have uh, been successful. So that's that's uh, that's good. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, don't know if it would be of interest to you, but uh, just see what your thoughts are. In discussions with Chair and, and Heidi in pre-Chair's uh, brief, the table that's on page 107, and I must stress this isn't an us, them, you, so forth, we're all one local planning authority, but we're just we're thinking about adding some additional columns to the table just for members' interest, and you can take away from it what you want as to what the recommendation was. And uh, the other one is, was it a delegated or a committee decision? Yeah, yeah. I just so, thought it would be helpful to understand the decisions and which way they're going. Yes. Are we getting it right? Not to point the finger, I think it's just good to know as an authority what we're doing. Because sometimes by the time, by the time through, you forget what route they've gone down, it can take quite a long time. So. Well, I, I'd say we have asked before whether these were delegated or our decision, yep. and unfortunately Richard wasn't ever able to tell us, or I can't remember, I'll get back to you, and then it gets lost in the fog of war, doesn't yeah. it? So it sounds like a Good support. Thing. Okay. It can be an awful long time. I've got one still sitting at the inspectorate uh, on my area, and it's a good two years. <laughs> so, you know... You've, you have forgotten by then what's what. Um, so are we all agreed that... that, uh, that right, that's fine. Is that note for Yes, note that, May please. May I just turn the recording off, please? Yes.